All right, well, it is an honor to be here tonight. My name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science teacher for 15 years, and now for about uh, 14 years, I've been doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. I don't like sneaking up on anybody, so I'll tell you right now what I believe. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate. I believe the evolution theory, as it's being presented in our universities, is one of the dumbest ideas in the history of humanity. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Evolution is not science. That's my contention. Now, before we get too far into this, we need to define a couple of terms, I guess. I have nothing against science. I taught science for years. I like the subject of science. But there is some poison mixed in with our science books. And that's all I'm concerned about. There are Basically, there are some lies that are used over and over and over and over to pr promote this evolution theory. Science is things that we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. Nobody's ever observed any evolution. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Now, if you want to believe it happened, that's perfectly fine, but that now becomes part of your religion that is not part of science. Science is things we know by observation, testing, and demonstration. Now, Florida has a law that requires textbooks to be accurate. All instructional material shall be accurate. Texas has a law that says instructional materials shall be factual, and theories shall be clearly distinguished from facts. Alab or Wisconsin has a law that says textbooks shall be accurate. Alabama has a code that says textbooks shall be adequate and current. I think these are all very reasonable laws, by the way. California has a law that says textbooks shall be factually accurate and reflect current and confirmed research. My contention is there is no current and confirmed research that supports the evolution theory. Evolution is not part of science, which is what this debate is about. This textbook says evolution is a fact. It says the evidence to support evolution is based on fossils, traces of evolutionary history in existing organisms, continental drift, direct observations of change, and the experimental production of new species. Well, first place, we'll go through each of these later on, but there's no way any fossil could possibly count as evidence for evolution. I mean, if you were in a court of law and you brought a bone you found in the dirt into the judge and said, Judge, this bone is the ancestor of everybody today. Well, they'd laugh at you. You can't prove that bone had any kids. You sure can't prove it had different kids. And why on earth would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do, which is produce something other than their kind? So fossils absolutely cannot possibly count as evidence for evolution because it is impossible to demonstrate that they had any kids that lived. You might believe that they're ancestral, but that's now not part of science. Science is what we can observe and test and study and demonstrate. Evo evolution is the other word that needs to, be, needs to be defined. Evolution has at least six different levels. Now, I read some of the stuff that Dr. Weisenberger wrote in uh, some letters to the editor in the past, and um, this has happened. I've had 75 debates now, and very f in the last 10 years especially, they've worked very hard to focus the, f the definition of evolution on only changes within the species or between species. I think this is a little bit deceptive, as I'm going to share with you tonight. Actually, there are six essential levels that would all have to take place in order for evolution to be true. First, we'd have to have cosmic evolution. Somehow, you have to have the origin of time, space, and matter. Before the matter can get together and make life, there has to be the matter. So how did the matter get here? Where did the energy come from? Where did the laws of nature come from? Those are all essential steps that they are included in the textbooks as part of evolution theory. But during debates, it's very frequent for the debater to say, well, this is not really what evolution is about. Well, I'm sorry, it has to happen for evolution to even take place. So yes, it is what evolution is about. Secondly, you'd have to have chemical evolution. According to the Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang produced hydrogen and maybe some helium. Well, then how on earth did we get all these other elements? You mean uranium evolved from hydrogen? We see lots of elements decay, break down. We don't see them go up without enormous energy input. And now you're back to the chicken and egg problem. You have to have the stars already existing to produce the higher elements. So you really got a problem. Either stellar evolution or organic evolution or chemical evolution had to come first. But either way, you have a chicken and an egg problem. Thirdly, you have what I call stellar evolution, which is where the stars would have to evolve. Nobody's ever seen a star forming. One professor said, oh, we see a star forming right now in Crab Nebula. I said, no, you don't. You see a spot getting brighter. You're assuming it is a star forming. It could be the dust is clearing and there's a star behind it. The fact is, we have never observed a star forming. We see stars blow up all the time. It's called a nova or a supernova. And yet there's enough stars out there right now that everybody on Earth can personally own two trillion of them to yourself. Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> Fourthly, there would have to be what's called organic evolution. Somewhere, somehow, long ago and far away, life had to get started by non-living material. Now, the evolutionist is left with the very embarrassing position of having to believe in spontaneous generation, even though it was proven wrong several hundred years ago. 
All the experiments by Francisco Reddy and Louis Pasteur and many others have said, look, life begets life. Life does not come from non-living material. One student was in a, sitting in the audience one time, and his question for me during the question time was, Dr. Hoven, uh, if scientists ever make life in the laboratory, what are you going to say then? I said, well, first of all, they are, a, they are a long ways from coming to that. They can barely make a few amino acids, okay? Secondly, if a bunch of intelligent scientists do produce life in the laboratory, then I would say that that proves that it takes intelligence to make life, which is what I've been saying all along, okay? But the evolutionist really is left with, the I think, the very embarrassing and totally anti-intellectual position of thinking that life came from something that was non-living long ago and far away. Why could it happen only once, 3.5 billion years ago? Why isn't it happening commonly, frequently? Hmm? Fourthly, we have what's called organic evolution. That's where life gets started. Fifthly is macroevolution. That's where an animal changes from one kind to another. Nobody's ever seen this. The Bible says the animals bring forth after their kind, and so the definition of kind would be those that are able to bring forth. A dog and a wolf can mate and bring forth offspring. A dog and a banana cannot. So in some cases, it's very obvious what are the same kind. In other cases, it's not obvious what exactly was the original created kind. And I think that's a valuable field of research that's worth doing. What were the original kinds? Probably the horse and the zebra descended from a common ancestor. That doesn't mean the horse and the pine tree descended from a common ancestor. So macroevolution is where you change from one kind to another. Nobody's ever seen that. Lastly, we have what's sometimes called microevolution. I object to this term. I think it's confusing because it's not really evolution. It's just a variation of the same kind of animal. But if you want to call it microevolution, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that if, with the qualification that I object to that because it's really just a variety within the same kind. The first five steps that would have to take place are actually totally religious. Now, the professors that promote evolution are always trying to focus the attention on microevolution where there are millions of examples. I mean, I agree. This one happens. There's no debate. Variations happen. The question is, are they limited or unlimited? And I think the obvious observations for the last 6,000 years of human history tell us variations are limited. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but you get a dog every single time. No exceptions. According to the Big Bang Theory, though, the Big Bang teaches 18 to 20 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang where nothing exploded and produced everything. <laughs> and 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down and formed a rocky crust. This is what the textbooks teach. Now, how some professors can say this is not part of evolutionary theory, I don't understand that, because it is part of evolutionary theory. It is an essential step. You have to get the Earth here before anything can evolve on the Earth. And so they say the Earth cooled down and a rocky surface was created, and they say as the Earth formed, it was like the moon and the earth's surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. But oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. This is what's in typical textbooks all across the world as part of the process of life getting here. This textbook says, then millions of years of torrential, torrential rains created great oceans. Yes, boys and girls, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Wow, I guess it is. It's totally stopped. It doesn't even happen. That's how slow it is. This is pure imagination. This is a fantasy, okay? If they want to believe that, that's perfectly fine. But I resent them using my tax dollars to cut down a perfectly good tree and print that and sell it to the kids and teach it as if it's a fact. That's not science. This textbook author says, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So the evolution theory teaches basically 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, Earth formed, then it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive three billion years ago. And this early life form found somebody to marry. Now there's a good trick. <clears throat> and something to eat, of course, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. That is pure fantasy. There's Grandpa, the soup right there. Okay. Uh, now, there's no question there's a lot of dogs, okay? No question. But the evolution theory believes all the dogs came from a rock. I would agree that all the dogs came from two dogs on Noah's Ark, but I would not agree that all the dogs came from a rock. So basically, the six stages would have to go like this. There'd have to be cosmic, chemical, and stellar evolution during the first few billion years of this imaginary history of the world. Then we'd have to have organic evolution somewhere, somehow, life has to get started. Then we have to have what's called macroevolution, where this life form changes to different kinds of life forms. Nobody has ever seen any of those, okay? Lastly, we have what's sometimes called microevolution. This one happens. That's all we observe. That's the end of science. Everything preceding this is pure religion which you are welcome to believe. I don't care what you believe. You can believe whatever you want. But don't call it science, and don't make all the taxpayers pay to teach it to the kids like it's part of science, because it's not. But just the jump from micro to macro 
takes an enormous leap of faith and logic. We never see a dog produce a non-dog. This is pure fantasy based on imagination. I want you to look at how the textbooks will change the definition of the word evolution. This textbook says evolution is change over time. Oh, well, who can argue with that? I agree, things change. Then it narrows it down. In other words, living things have changed over time. Oh, now you've narrowed it down to living things. Well, it looks to me like you're skipping the first four steps that would have to happen. I mean, what happened to cosmic, chemical, stellar, and organic? I mean, you're just going to ignore them as if it just take it as a given? I don't think so. That's a really major flaw in the evolution logic. Third, then they narrow it down again. Evolution can be defined as a change in species over time. Oh, well, I don't know anybody that would argue with that. Species change over time. The question is, are they limited? And the question is, do these changes lead to any macro changes? And the answer from all observable science is, no, they do not. If you want to believe they do, or they could have, or they might have, or given enough time, well, you're welcome to believe whatever you want. But now you've just gone into a fantasy world of religion. You've left science. And the topic of the debate tonight is evolution science. The first five meanings of the word are not science. What they really mean by evolution is all six. They want you to think all six definitions are connected, and I can assure you they are not. There is no relationship between any of those. So what evidence do they give for the kids to, to believe this evolution theory? I collect textbooks. I have hundreds of them. Here's the typical evidence they use to support evolution, and I'm sure we'll see some of this tonight. They're going to say we've got evidence from fossils. I pointed out no fossil is possibly, it cannot possibly count for evolution. Evidence from structure. Evidence from molecular biology, DNA, we'll get into that. Evidence from development. They say the process of evolution is based on natural selection. Well, there's no evidence to support evolution except things that have been proven wrong years ago. We'll get into those in a minute. If there's real evidence for evolution, then please show me, but don't lie to the kids. All I think, I just think lies ought to be taken out of the textbooks, and then if you have anything left to support your theory, great, show it to me. But I'm telling you, what's being shown to the kids in this university to support the evolution theory is a bunch of things that have been proven wrong years ago. Get them out of the books and give me some real scientific evidence. Evolution is based on two faulty assumptions. They say mutations make something new and possibly better, sometimes worse, but they hopefully is better. Nobody's ever seen this happen. Then secondly, natural selection is supposed to make it survive and take over the population. Well, if you follow that logic through, evolution is a religion of death. In order for evolution to work, one animal has to evolve a little better than the rest then what must happen to the rest of them in order for this good change to work? They all got to die. You follow that logic just a few more steps and you're Adolf Hitler. Let's just speed up the process and kill off those that we think are inferior. And we'll save the superior ones, you know, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians and Germans, ya yeah, sure, you betcha, okay? <laughs> this textbook says mutations are the original source of variation. There's no question mutations happen, but they do not produce evolution. Mutations produce changes that are almost always fatal or certainly harmful. Nobody's ever dem demonstrated a positively beneficial mutation. There's a five-legged bull, that's a mutant, but no new information is added. Here's a short-legged sheep, that's a mutant, but again, no new information is added. It's a loss of information. Here's a two-headed turtle, that's a mutant. It's not ninja, but it's mutant, okay? And he's going to freeze first winter because nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater, see? Mutations are scrambling existing information. Like scrambling up the letters of the word Christmas, you can get all sorts of different words. But you will never get Xerox, Zebra, or Queen out of the word Christmas because the letters are not available. A mutation should really produce some new information. This textbook shows the kids a fruit fly. Look what it says here. Boys and girls, normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. By the way, he can't fly. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Then it says, beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Oh, now hold on just a minute. Why didn't they give an example of a beneficial mutation? Why would they show the kids a bad one and then tell them, good ones is how it works? Show me a good one. Nobody's ever seen a good one. One guy told me, oh, I know a good one. He said, people in Africa that get sickle cell anemia cannot get malaria. Well, that's just brilliant. That's like saying, if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot. Both sickle cell and malaria are detrimental. That's not an advancement. Think about it. They're going to say evolution and natural selection go together. No, it does not. Natural selection selects. It doesn't create. It selects. You can only select if there's something to select from. We had at our place a few weeks ago the world's smallest horse. 
Suppose I said, I'm going to get all the horses in the world, and I'm going I'm to try to get horses that are less, that are the size of a flea. So anything over the size of a flea, I'm going to kill them all, and let only those under the size of a flea survive. How long would it take me to get a population of horses the size of a flea? It'll never happen because I have nothing to select from. Natural selection selects, it does not create. And how they get this idea that natural selection will create something, I don't know. It just simply selects. All biologists know it does not create properties. But Darwin said, evolution by natural selection was going to be the way it happened. And this textbook says, evolution by natural selection had occurred in just one year with the finches. Oh, come on. Darwin observed 14 varieties of finches on the Galapagos Islands. He, all he saw was that finches produce finches. Now, if you want to believe they came from a rock, well, you just go ahead and believe that, but that's not science. This textbook says natural selection can lead to evolution. I disagree. That is simply pure propaganda. Natural selection selects. It does not lead to any changes within the kind, or with, other than within the kind. It only causes varieties to be produced. If you worked in a factory that produced cars, and your job was quality control, check the cars before they sell them. You know, kick the tires, slam the doors, walk around, drive it, see if it works, okay? If you weeded out every single mistake, how long would it take to change the car to an airplane? You say, it never will. <laughs> That's my point. Quality control can make it a good car and keep it a good car, but it can't change it to something else. And natural selection can keep it a good species, but it can't change it to something else. That's the whole point. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you're going to get a dog, folks. There are some pretty bizarre varieties among the dog family, but they're all dog. And believe it or not, the Chihuahua and the Great Dane are still interfertile, except for a few mechanical problems, but it can be done, okay? Um, Probably the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But every kid knows they're the same animal. Anybody in the room here five or six or seven years old? No, little ones. Well, I normally do this with a five-year-old. I'll ask them, okay, boys and girls, here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? Every single time they get it, okay, it's the banana. A child can tell you it's always the same kind. National Geographic ran an article about wolf to wolf, how dogs evolve from wolves. I agree, but it's not evolution. It's a variety of the same kind, and they're still interfertile. And that's what the Bible says the kind definition was, those that can bring forth. So nothing new was created. The Bible says they bring forth after his kind, and if you've got an exception to that, I'd like to see it. Variations happen, but they are limited. Farmers have been trying for years to get bigger pigs, but they're never going to get a pig as big as Texas. There are limits. Roaches down where I live in Florida become resistant to pesticides after a while. Like bacteria become resistant to drugs. I agree. But the roaches will never become resistant to a sledgehammer. Okay, there is a limit. And the bacteria have limits to how far they can vary within their already existing gene code. They always produce the same kind of plant or animal. That's not really evolution because the information was already present in the gene code. No new information is added. Real evolution would be new information. How long would the Chihuahuas last in the real world, huh? All these varieties that we get, if it wasn't for somebody protecting them, they wouldn't survive. Turn all the Chihuahuas loose back into the woods. They'd run up to the wolf. Yip, 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 crunch. End of gene pool, right? <laughs> genetic information is always lost, not added. Real evolution means an increase in genetic complexity. I defy anybody to show me where that's happened and produced any changes in the population. I grew up in Illinois, corn country. We've got so many kinds of corn, they number them. But you can crossbreed your corn till, from now till the cows come home, and you'll always get corn. You'll never get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on your corn stalk, okay? It ain't going to happen. Variety of dogs happen, I agree. This Irish textbook calls it divergent evolution. They say the poodle, the terrier, and the collie had a common ancestor. Oh, come on, it's still a dog. Giving it a fancy name doesn't change the facts. It's not divergent evolution. It's a variety of dog. That's deceptive. To, see, they're going to give this as evidence for evolution, and then a the kid psychologically is going to think the whole theory's been proven. When well, nothing could be further from the truth. This Mexican textbook says the zebra and the horse had a common ancestor. I agree. And it looked like a horse. Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery, all the standard equipment. Okay, it was a horse. They got big horses and little horses today, all kinds of them. And it's interesting, horses, they're, they're, they're limits, they're limited. There's some folks in California that have contests. They crossbreed horses, zebras, uh, donkeys. They get zorses, zonkeys, zionis, zedonks, and chebras. 
Here's their website. They will all inter they're all interbreeding. Okay, guess what that proves? They probably came from the original kind. A horse. There's a bunch of zebroids running around. In the Kentucky Derby in the last 100 years, they've gone from an average winning speed of 127 seconds down to 123 seconds. Doc, now back in the early days, they got some low times turned in back then too. But let me ask you a question. How much money would you guess has been spent on the Kentucky Derby trying to breed faster horses? Millions and millions and millions of dollars, right? Now, I don't know if they've reached the absolute limit or not. I don't know. But I suspect they're getting kind of close. And the point is, they're still horses, and there seems to be a stone wall here. You can't go faster. If you really want to win the Kentucky Derby, why don't you breed wings on your horse and fly around the track in 12 seconds? <laughs> All I'm trying to point out is, variations certainly happen, but they're limited. And the evolutionist does not want to confess or admit there are limits. He wants to imagine that it can go on forever indefinitely. Well, you just go ahead and imagine all you want, but keep the, your religion out of the school system. There's a variety of cows, no question. They probably had a common ancestor. It was a cow. There's a bunch of chickens. What kind of chicken you want? You want to get cherry eggers, brown leghorns, golden comets? This magazine that sells chicken says, boys and girls, jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. You know, all the chickens had a common ancestor. Guess what it was? Uh, chicken. Yeah, that's the point. Textbooks will tell the kids that the peppered moth is evidence for evolution. They counted the moths on the trees. They said it was 95% light moss and 5% black. Then, so the story goes, they burned coal in the factories and the trees turned black. And they counted the moths again, you know, renewed their government grant, and found out it's now 5% light and 95% black. The truth of the matter is the whole story is a phony. It didn't happen, okay? The guy glued dead moths on the trees to take that picture for your textbook. Okay? After 40 years of watching, they found two moths on the trees. Two. What's 95% of two? <laughs> but they still keep teaching this in the books, even though it's been proven wrong years ago. Tulsa Zoo, a couple of months ago I was there, has, still has this up as a display. Come on, take that down and tear that page out of your book. That's not evidence for evolution. You know, more on the peppered moth, get the website iconsofevolution.com. There's a bunch on there about this topic. Textbooks will tell you kids, you've got a vestigial organ called the appendix. You don't need it anymore. Well, that's simply a lie. You do need your appendix, okay? It is not vestigial. There are no vestigial organs. Your appendix is part of your immune system. Now, if you take out your appendix, it's true you can still live, okay? But you will have a higher susceptibility for quite a few diseases. Do you know, you can live without both your legs and both your eyes and both your arms. That doesn't prove you don't need them. The fact that you can live without something does not prove it is vestigial, and that certainly is not evidence for evolution. Think about it. This textbook says, the snake has vestigial reduced hind legs. Oh, they're lying to you. Those little claws right there are used in mating so they can maneuver each other into position. They don't have any arms, you know. <laughs> this textbook says many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. Whales have a vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. They have hind limb bones that have no function. This is in textbooks all across the world. Just imagine whales walking around, it's true. What are they talking about? They're talking about those bones right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. <laughs> I can't imagine. It says the whale's pelvis has no apparent function. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. This is simply a lie, okay? Those bones are necessary if there are muscles attached to those specialized bones for, to allow the whales to reproduce. It has nothing to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting more baby whales. So the guys that are writing this in their textbooks are either extremely ignorant about whale anatomy, and they should not be writing a book about it, and certainly shouldn't be teaching about it, or they're lying to you, trying to give you evidence for their theory. That's not evidence for the theory. Those are not vestigial pelvises. Any more than your kneecap, since it's not attached to other bones, is vestigial. Okay, or the hyoid bone, it's not attached either, but it's not vestigial. These bones are anchor points that muscles attach to for reproduction. This textbook says humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. Its vestigial structures is viewed as evidence for evolution. Oh, the tailbone is not vestigial. I was in a debate in Alabama with the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association. He got up in front of God and everybody and said, folks, uh, we got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they no longer need. I said, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. 
won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, if you think the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. That's not a vestigial tailbone, okay? And by the way, kids, if any biology professor or any anatomy professor ever tells you the tailbone is vestigial, my offer is still good, I will pay to have theirs removed. <laughs> Tell them, put up or shut up. It is not vestigial, okay? This textbook says the coccyx, at the end of the human vertebral column, is no apparent function. And it's thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree-living ancestor. They told me when I was a kid, man used to have a tail, but he lost it because we didn't need it. I thought, didn't need it? Have you ever thought how handy a tail would be? <laughs> have you ever come to the door with two sacks of groceries? And you could open that thing up and walk right in there, you know? It's not vestigial. That's a lie. And a lot of functions for those tail bones, all right? There are no vestigial structures, and if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. We could talk for hours, and we're going to quit here in a few minutes, but they, all the evidence that they're using, like Lucy, australopithecines, you know, as evidence for evolution. First place, it's a fossil. It doesn't count for anything. You don't know Lucy had any kids. Okay. Secondly, Lucy, all those that studied Lucy, said it's just a vestigial, uh, it's, it's, just, it's, not a, it's just an unusual monkey. It could walk upright, possibly, we don't know for sure. It had an angled femur. Any monkey that climbs trees has an angled femur. Okay. We could, we'd cover that a lot more on that, or in the book Bones of Contention, there's a lot about Lucy and other so-called missing links. Um, they give, in the National Geographic here, gives human feet to all of the hominid examples here. This is pure propaganda, okay? The feet are extremely different in these creatures. And there's no connection between one evolving to another and no evidence that one ever did. And again, you're dealing with fossils. They don't count. Think about it. In a court of law, they would laugh at you. Australopithecines, no fossils for evidence. Or no fossils are going to count for evidence for evolution. The horse evolution series is taught in textbooks, yet it's been proven wrong 50 years ago. The gradual evolution of the modern horse has not held up to close examination. Back in 1950, G.G. G. Simpson, who believed in evolution and loved the theory and taught it, said, the evolution of the horse family it was unintentionally falsified. The early classical evolutionary tree of the horse was all wrong. It never happened in nature. This has been proven wrong 50 years ago, but they're still teaching it in your textbooks. The evolution of the horse. Up here at the Yale University, they still got a big display of the horse, how it evolved from Eohippus to Equus. Pure propaganda. Didn't happen in nature. Darwin considered the idea that the human embryo has gills and he slowly evolved from a fish-like creature to a human. He considered that the best single class of facts in favor of his theory. This is, he called it the biogenetic law. This Irish textbook says, these similar, it's talking about the gills here, gill slits, show that these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. This one says, humans have gills like a fish when they're embryonic stage. This is a lie. Those are not gill slits. Those little folds of skin later develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen folks that have five or six chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one. Okay? <laughs> they're not gill slits. Haeckel actually lied. He faked the pictures of a human and dog embryo. He made them look just alike. Haeckel was a liar. He made giant charts of his pictures showing that these embryos of all these different animals have gill slits. This is a lie. On top are Haeckel's drawings. Underneath are the photographs of the actual creatures. Either he's a lousy artist or he's a liar, okay? Haeckel actually confessed to lying in court at University of Jena, but his textbooks are the textbooks today. I guarantee you this university has a biology or anatomy textbook that teaches that the embryo has gill slits and is that's evidence for evolution. That's been proven wrong 127 years ago. Get it out of the book. If you have evidence for evolution, then stop lying. Then show it to me, but quit lying to the kids and tell them you do. I want you to listen carefully tonight. If any evidence for evolution is presented, as if it is scientific, I suspect you're going to hear things like vestigial structures. You're going to hear things like embryology. That's the code word for what they're talking about here. This has all been proven wrong a long time ago. So don't buy that stuff. It's been in the textbooks for far too long. Kenneth Miller is still teaching it after 125 years of knowing it's been proven wrong. I've got all kinds of stuff. We've got to quit. Here, okay. This is, I just don't want to see kids lied to. I think there is no evidence to support the idea that any animal produced a different kind of animal. Now, if you want to believe it happened, just you enjoy yourself. You believe whatever you want. But don't call it science. And don't make all the taxpayers pay to teach it to the kids in public schools. Those who believe in evolution should admit it is a religion, and they should start private schools all over America, all over America, and let those who want to pay and learn it come pay and learn it. They've got no business making all of us taxpayers pay for the silly religion to be taught in the school system. Thank you so much.
started by saying that, uh, in fact, I'm not going to come here today and give you a class on evolution. You are more than welcome to come and take my class on evolution. Or if you want to see responses to th what he said, uh, Scientific American had a, I don't know if you can read that. Okay. Uh, you read, can you read the sheet? See the overhead all right in the back? Okay. Uh, Scientific American had a point by point response to the stuff that the creationists say. Uh, I wrote a letter to Scientific American after this. Uh, they didn't publish it, I think I know why, but, uh, and I said, excuse me, you just walked right into their trap, you fools, right? What do they want, the creationists? They want to put their ideas, their theories, and evolution on a kind of equal basis, right? It's like right here, it's me versus him, right? And that's what they did in Scientific American. Love it. They say, oh, because now what they're going to do on their website, they'll say, oh, no, Scientific American's all wrong. I point out something to you, and it's important to me, if not to you. There are thousands upon thousands, tens upon tens of thousands, of hardworking, intelligent, well-educated scientists. These are the people we're out there digging the fossils that he doesn't think matter, but they're sure as hell working their butts off digging them and studying them, right? There's thousands of others analyzing the DNA of organisms, trying to sort them out, collecting animals, right? They're standing behind me. You can't see them. They're all busy working, doing their science, okay? So this is, this is, of course, in a sense, a totally unfair argument. He'll say X, I'll say Y, you'll say, well, I believe X, because I came in here to believe in X. So read that if you want the, if you want the response. I have actually a, a different focus. I'm not going to sit here and defend evolution. It doesn't need defending. Okay? <laughs> of Richard. And God appeared to me, and she said, Richard, I created all that you see and study, the mountains and their fossils, strewn rocks, the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, hey, even the isotopes and the stones by which you measure their age. It actually happened. And I was stunned. God was a woman. And yet, what else would she be? <laughs> Again, God spoke. Spake, excuse me, it's biblical. Again, God spake. <laughs> what say you to these revelations, Richard? Will thou not give up thy false idol of evolution? Nay, God, though I find your revelations interesting, you have given me no cause to give up the theory of evolution. It is indeed a great wonder that you have created, but the facts remain unchanged. Evolution alone allows us humble scientists to understand your creations and to predict what we will find when we explore it further. Until evolution fails me, I must follow it, for I will not abandon my oath as a scientist. Facts, verifiable facts, must be my one true God. Yeah. So, now, now let me say, one of the problems with, the, the, with this whole debate is in the scientific community there is no debate, right? Scientists who study this stuff pretty much you know, they just, they pretty much ignore the creationists until they discover their kids can't learn evolution in science class, all right? Now, I just want to give you a taste of sort of what's going on. And what I did, I have here the last two issues of Science and Nature. These are the premier weekly science journals. Uh, and I went through, this is from last week, this is uh, 25 October and 24th of October. 
and look for any articles related to evolution. So this is sort of a random, random selection, right? So let me just quickly share with you some of the current, and this is all, I, I, I'm going to talk about everything, every time evolution or an evolution subject came up in these, uh, I'm going to share it with you just briefly. You first can go to the library and read the articles yourself. Uh, the first one, I'm looking now at science. First one is called Jumbled DNA Separates Chimps in Humans, with a picture of a chimp and a child. I don't have a, a protector of this. Uh, the results are quite exciting, says Michael Connolly, a human geneticist at Indiana University. With this research, we can really find out so much more about evolution. Okay. Actually, what they discovered is they're finding there's somewhat more genetic difference than they originally had measured. Because see, now the data is coming in much more rich data. We're getting the sequence of the genes, of the DNA. So the data is much richer, and they're looking forward to that. Uh, the next article called Cuts at Dino Monument Anger Researchers. The researchers are mad uh, at Dinosaur National Monument in, uh, in Colorado, I guess where it is, uh, because they're cutting back the staff of people who are studying dinosaur fo uh, honey fossils. And actually the quote I thought was interesting was that uh, Amy Henrissi of Carnegie Mellon Uni uh, Museum of, uh, in Pittsburgh, she studies some of the oldest frog fossils. Her specialty is frog fossils. Now, who would study frog fossils? Somebody in the evolution of amphibians, I guess, all right? And she's very upset because now she's not going to have enough easy re out re access to the material she needs to do her science. What's she going to do without her frog fossils? I don't know. Become a creationist, I suppose. No, she wants, she's a scientist. She's, she needs facts. She needs data. She needs those fossils. Those fossils do tell a story. You know, he says, oh, you can't prove anything by fossils. Well, you got to prove something by it. Uh, the next article is titled Darwin. Darwin retains seat in Ohio. It's a news article. Uh, having to do with the uh, battle between creationists and evolution in Ohio schools with an attempt to, of course, get the one version or another of creationism into the schools. What was interesting, actually, there was a survey did uh, just before the uh, vote, Case Western uh, University did a survey. I don't know who they surveyed. It's a very short article. It says of 500 respondents, including some from fundamentalist colleges, 93% they were not aware of any evidence that challenges the principles of evolution. I don't know who those other 7% are. Maybe they are from those fundamental schools, but 93% is still pretty good. I, I think from working biologists, it's 100%. People actually study biology. Uh, I'm getting there. We're getting there. I'm giving you, I'm giving you facts. This is, you can look them up. Uh, discussion of the origin of life on page 4747. Go to your library. Some, some articles here. Uh, and what's important, actually, in that discussion, it's actually a little debate about high temperature versus low temperature models for the, the what he calls chemical evolution. Um, they don't mention evolution, actually, in those letters, because they're talking about the origin of life, not evolution. It's a different subject. Um, well, there's another thing here which is way too complex to get into about network theory. Uh, pass on that one. Um, there's another one about aging and the evolution of aging and how that could could have happened, aging theories. Uh, you can, if you want, you can look it up and see how they're applying evolution theory to that study. Want some facts? I'll give you some facts. Okay, let me jump right ahead to that. I'll skip some of these uh, other articles, because there's, turned out there was really some interesting ones in this issue of nature. Uh, here's an article, you're gonna love this title, Contemporary Fisherian Life history evolution of small salmonoid populations 
Uh, of course, he's going to say this is just microevolution, but they actually do it kind of is demonstrated through a study of the salmon population that it has evolved over the time that they've been studied. So they actually have the actual data showing evolution in that population. And finally, uh, in this issue, or not finally, there's one more, uh, something about uh, moths' mating preference. And they've done a study of moths and how the chromosomal structure in the moths and how the sexual uh, gender is determined in moths relates to their evolution. And my point here is just to point out, evolution is, you know, it's, it's part of biology. It's not going anywhere. It's not disappearing because it works. Uh, finally, and I just thought I would share this, the final article, and, I, and when I got to it, I said, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. This one is called, this article, page 832, you can look it up, it's called Detecting Recent Positive Selection in the Human Genome from Haplotype Structure. It's got quite a few authors, uh, Sabeti, Reich, Higgins, Levin, Richter, Schaffner, Gabriel, Plankto, Peterson, McDonald, Ackerman, Campbell, Ashla, Cooper, Kowalski, Ward, and Lander. Uh, they're from a variety of institutes, uh, Oxford mostly, and also Mass General Hospital, uh, Illinois, MIT. Now these poor deluded souls from all those institutions around the world have examined what are called haplotypes. I know you're not biologists, I don't want to get into it, but haplotypes are a particular type of genetic structure. And they've looked at those haplotypes and from that, I'll quote for you. It says, core haplotypes, I'm sorry about the, all the, you know, sometimes the lingo is a little, it's just what it is. And I can't, you know, I'm not responsible for it. Core haplotypes, what's that? What a haplotype is? A haplotype is uh, several genes on a chromosome that are inherited together. So what they're doing is looking at several genes that are inherited together and analyzing the pattern of that inheritance. And here's what they say. Uh, core haplotypes that have an unusually high haplotype homozygosity, I'm not going to explain that, <laughs> indicate the presence of a mutation that rose to prominence in the human gene pool faster than expected under neutral evolution and they, they conclude that these data show significant evidence for, of selection, that is evolution by natural selection. I just need to wet my whistle. So, now look, you know, I'm, I know you want me to stand up here and talk about the wonderful fossils and the peppered moth. I don't like errors and lies any more than anybody else in textbooks. I can tell you, by the way, I'm writing a textbook myself, and putting figures in a textbook is a nightmare, and, and I now know better why those textbook figures keep popping up over and over again. Okay. What I'm here to do is teach you a little bit about science, because here's the fundamental problem. Creationists don't do science. They don't understand science. They're clueless. Let's look at what the problems are with the creations. Okay? I'm trying. Let me just. Oh, don't grab the mic. Can you hear me better now? Okay. Problem with creationism I want to go over briefly bad logic, bad facts, bad science, bad theology. So let's look at them in order. Okay. First of all, here's an example of creationist logic. Well, it's just, can, you know, can we turn those lights off over the, uh, just those one set of uh, blackboard lights? That's perfect. Okay. Here's an example of creationist logic. Uh, no physical evidence, such as photographs, exists of George Washington. 
No one alive has ever seen George Washington, have they? Has anybody here ever seen George Washington? Any historians actually ever seen George Washington? No. no. Only man-made documents exist. And you know what? Some of those documents are forgeries. Following creationist logic, we must therefore conclude George Washington did not exist. <laughs> Look, that's not the way science works. Okay? Science is a process of debate between alternative explanations. If you're going to challenge evolution, you've got to come up with a better theory, one that offers explanations. Now, I know that Dr. Hovind has a $250,000, it's still $250,000? A million. A million. Well, all right. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. I haven't got to my challenge yet. Uh, I mentioned also bad fact. Here's what the creationists do about the facts. Uh, first thing they'll do, they'll say it's just microevolution. Now, I teach evolution, all right? I never talk about macroevolution because, in fact, micro macroevolution are one and the same thing. Give enough time, you can turn anything into anything. Yeah, that's true. It's true. All right. I have proven. It's proven. You got the fossil record. It shows all the steps. <laughs> now, if he can, I mean, the, the problem here is what is a type? You know, he says, okay, a chicken's a chicken. But wait a minute. A chicken's also a bird, right? Uh -huh. Birds give rise to birds. It's not that much different between a chicken and a turkey. Maybe they have a common ancestor, right? And so on back in time till you get to something, archaeopteryx, all right? Check a, a bird with a bee. Well, it's just a fossil. <laughs> Worse than my students. All right, so what, typically what the creationists do, they'll deny the existence of tens of thousands of transitional fossils. Go, look, go to a museum, look at the fossils yourself. They're there. They are there. They do exist. Scientists who study these things believe they tell a story, just as historians who study documents, which are nothing more than fossils. Historical documents are nothing more than historical fossils, except they're made by man. Fossils are actual physical objects, okay? They harp about the occasional air. God, if I hear about the peppered moth one more time, I'm gonna vomit. I don't teach the peppered moth. They should, the peppered moth, Tori, we know one thing for, that we actually measure, the number of black and white morphs changed over time. There are different theories as to exactly why that happened. That's the peppered moth, okay? Same thing with Henkel's diagrams. Come on, we got a lot better pictures of that than that. Biologists didn't quit studying this stuff with Darwin, you know. Uh, typically, you know, the creationists remain ignorant of current research. I just showed you some. You won't hear creationists attacking that because they don't know about it. Whenever a physicist, chemist, geologist, astronomer, zoologist, geneticist, paleontologist, or any other fully qualified scientist makes a discovery that sports evolution, typically creationists ignore it, treat it as some kind of conspiracy, misinterpret it, you know, claim it actually doesn't exist. And this part really, really gets my goat. They require of evolution perfect data and absolute proof but accept even the most superficial evidence in their support of their position. <laughs> the real world and real science is real. You know, there are gaps, there's data. You know, I've done experiments. I've been in the lab, and I've been out and looked at fossil beds. It's a messy business. Let them do as well. Now, the, the real problem is creationism is not even a proper science. 
to be a proper science, you have to have an explanation for something that you can test. I look really, really hard for a theory of creationism. Uh, and this is the best I could come up with. This is a, a Gary Larson cartoon, and I studied it very hard. And, and I understand some of it, but I cannot figure out what the duck is all about. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe somebody can explain what the duck But that's about as close as you get to a scientific theory of creationism. So I have, now I get to my challenge. This is my $250,000 to the creationists. Describe a physical mechanism used by the creator and based upon this mechanism, make a unique prediction that's different from evolution, which can be tested. Now, look at, did the creator work outside of natural law? If you believe that, then fine, that's okay, but don't tell me that's some kind of science. Science is about how things work and trying to understand how things work. If you're going to give me a creation theory, you gotta at least make an effort to tell me how it was done so I can test it. Can't test it. Not science. Construct a realistic computer model that incorporates the known properties of living organisms, including variation, mutation, competition for resources, and the known age of the Earth, I should have added in that, which does not lead to evolution. People who do the computer models out pops evolution, including macroevolution and change of organisms and from one type to another. It's in the computer programs. It's in the math. Creationists don't like it, but then they don't do their own math to counteract it. This one I like, number four. Construct either a unified theory of creation that brings together all of the creation stories of the world's different religions or describe a scientific method for determining which one is valid. Now, you know, look, he can believe what he wants, too. We all have our right to our beliefs, okay? But if we're talking science, you have to have a means of testing your beliefs against nature, against reality. And if you can't do that, it's not science. Let's talk about, you know, here's a couple of specifics that I wouldn't mind seeing an explanation for. Explain why the Creator placed unique species on the islands of the world, as well as different species on different continents. I guess there was a whim of the Creator. Evolution explains that naturally. It's a process of evolution. Maybe he can ask an explanation. I don't know. I haven't heard one from creationism. Explain why creationism does not by the law, violate the laws of conservation of mass, first and second laws of thermodynamics. Why we should abandon these laws. You know, one of the things that really gets my goat is sometimes creationists will say, well, you know, evolution violates such and such a law of nature. You know, first law, second law, whatever. I, wait a minute, you're talking about a process that's outside of natural law, how can you attack us who understand and use natural law? All right, it's, it's a mystery to me, okay? Now, pointed out that creationism misuses the facts all right? Bad science. It's also bad theology. <laughs> let, me re let me just uh, tell you a little story. True story, actually. Um, some of my stories are true. Um, when I was in college, <laughs> yeah, I'm an evolutionary biologist. Well, you can't believe me. Uh, when I was in college, I had a roommate who was a uh, born-again Christian, and he used to, every night, would read the Bible. And frankly, it used to irritate me. He'd have the light on, and I'd be trying to sleep, and I'd hear that, those pages flip. 
And I said to him one day, I said, come on, you know, that Bible, you can interpret it any which way, blah, blah, you know, the usual argument that you get between somebody of my beliefs and somebody of his beliefs. So I took the Bible from him and I said, look, I'll interpret something in the Bible. I opened it up and I wound up in Revelations and started reading the seventh seal. And here are some bits from it. And he opened the pit, and there arose a great smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and into them was given power as the scorpions have power. And it was given them that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented for five months. And their torment was the torment of a, of a scorpion when he striked at the man. And on, okay, thank you. And on their heads, were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had breastplates, as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And I looked at that, and I said to my roommate, this was about 1960, oh, I don't want to tell, 1960-something. I've been around, the, you know, around for a while. But it was at the height of the Cold War, right? When we were afraid that we are going to be, have a big, a nuclear holocaust. And I said, oh, well, this is easy. I can interpret that. The pit, that's an underground missile silo. And these locusts with breastplates of iron, those are the missiles, right? And they come out of the ground. There's smoke. There's a great furnace, right? And there's this, this sound of many chariots as the rockets come from the earth. And kaboom, and then you get... You know, a nuclear attack and radiation poisoning and oh, and I and I was saying all this to him, and then all of a sudden I thought, and he looked at me, and he said, "You see?" And I went, "Oh my gosh, you know, that's quite a, uh, yeah, that's really something. That's, yeah." Now, if I was interpreting this today, I would make it a little different. Uh, I'd probably say that. The five months torment here, that's probably from Saddam Hussein and his uh, factories of, of uh, biological or chemical warfare, and that uh, the interesting was the breast, breast, breastplates of iron and the faces of man, that, they're, that the, uh, these locusts had the faces of man. I said, yeah, that would probably be a portrait of Saddam Hussein, because he puts his portrait on everything. Be on the missiles, too. Look, my point is this. You know, I know he's a, a good Christian. My opponent's a good Christian, and many good Christians here. But doesn't this tell us, then, that we better be get out there and start killing locusts? Can we not be moved to action? Right? Especially, we got to go looking for armor-plated locusts. Got to kill them before they do this to us. Now, come on. Whatever, whatever your religious beliefs, I'm sorry. That kind of interpretation of the Bible just doesn't wash. Either is good theology, or is certainly is good science. I want to finish. I'm finishing. It's my last. Okay, it's my last overhead. Perfect timing. Thank you. Look. I know that my opponent has talked about this being a kind of a battle. Creation is battle cry. Here's what they tell you, and I see there are some young people, some children in here, some students, and this is what they tell you, and I find this offensive. Reject evolution or reject your faith. That's what they tell you. They tell you this is the, this is the battleground, right? If you are an evolutionist, you believe in evolution, well, then you've got to reject that particular version of, of the faith, right? Can you be a good Christian and reject and, and accept evolution? Well, so, okay, there you go. And I say to them, that is not the way it should be. There's a peace offering, okay? Science and religion deal with different domains of human experience. If you want to have a battle and you want to put 
your religion toe-to-toe -to -toe with science, nobody gains, right? You tell you to the young person growing up who's studying biology and learning about fossils and learning about DNA, you say to that young person, hey, don't accept that, otherwise you can't be a good Christian. Now, I'm sorry, that's offensive, okay? There are many good Christians, many good Jews, many good Buddhists, Muslims, whatever, in the scientific community who study evolution. And they deserve the respect that they've earned from their hard work. Okay? Thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to a 15 minute rebuttal from Dr. Hovind. Well. That was very interesting. Let me give you my rebuttal of some of the things that he said. I don't think we'll have time to give them all. His consistent theme throughout his talk was basically based on majority opinion. You know, in the scientific community, there is no debate. This implies, of course, you know, if you don't believe in evolution, then you're not a scientist. And if you do, if you do, you know, you, you, you can't be a scientist without believing in evolution. This is simply not true. And this is a very flawed logic used in any debate to say that majority opinion supports your position. First, I don't think you could prove that it's true, okay? I think you'd find there are thousands of scientists very actively involved in major branches of science that are strong Bible-believing creationists. But I want to point out, the debate tonight is about is evolution, science, and he continually brought in, you know, things about creation, which is not what the debate's supposed to be about, okay? I'm willing to debate that, but that's not the topic tonight. Okay. He said, there are tens of thousands of scientists digging fossils, and they support evolution. Great. Tell them, go for it. There were tens of thousands of people who thought that big rocks fall faster than little rocks at one time. That was taught for 2,000 years in the school system. And it was wrong. There were tens of thousands of people that thought if you took your blood out, you would get better. It's talk, called the doctrine of humors. They were wrong. Okay. There are also tens of thousands of people who do not believe in evolution. All the polls show that only about 9% of the population of America believes in the evolution theory with no God involved. Another 30% think God used evolution. Even the two together is a vast minority of the population, okay? So you don't go on majority opinion anyway, but if you want to go on majority opinion, then the majority support the creation view, okay? He said, this is important to me. I guess so. You get paid by the taxpayers to teach this stuff. Of course it's important to you. <laughs> this argument for majority opinion implies those who don't believe in evolution are dumb. How many of you would understand that? He said, we walked into their trap. They want to put creation and evolution on an equal plane. Well, this is certainly why the evolutionists try very desperately to avoid any debates. We get turned down. I get turned down about 200 times for every one we get accepted for to do a debate on this topic. And their arguments are, we don't want to put them on an equal plane. Well, th the Soviet Union teachers would say the same thing 50, 20 years ago. We don't want to talk about capitalism and you know, communism together. We don't want them on an equal plane because we know communism is so superior. This is obviously flawed logic about the equal plane argument that he mentioned. The students ought to be able to see all sides of the issue. If you're not showing all sides of the issue, you're indoctrinating, you're not educating. He said, facts are my true God. Well, I pointed out a bunch of things in the textbooks that are used as facts that are not true. I have yet to see any facts presented tonight that support the evolution theory. Also, I'd like you to show me any facts that have stood the test of time. I don't know if you caught what he said earlier, but he talked about creationists don't keep up on the most current research. The most current research. Well, first place, I think a lot of creationists, myself included, try to keep up on the most current research. but. The fact of the matter is, the evolutionists are always relying on the most current research. They'll say, well, we just discovered in the laboratory. I say, wait a minute, right there. This theory has been around for 140 years. You're relying on things that are just discovered and haven't stood the test of time yet. Like the one in uh, 99, uh, November 99, when National Geographic ran the big article about the fossil half bird, half reptile. Three years, three months later, it's proven fraudulent. This happens over and over and over in the evolution theory. They teach something for a few years. Oops, we're sorry, it was wrong. Okay, let's go teach something else. Oh, we're sorry, it's wrong. Okay, we'll teach something else. Forget about this current, I don't, don't forget about the current research. I'm in favor of that. But 
Don't use that as evidence till it has stood the test of time. Show me some facts that have stood the test of time. All of the so-called cavemen get proven wrong one by one. Nebraska man was in the textbooks for a while. Piltdown man was in the textbooks for 40 years and it was proven wrong. It was a deliberate fraud. Just study the facts and you'll see there are no facts that support evolution theory that have stood the test of time. All false theories die very hard. The geocentric theory died a horrible death along with people who dared to question it, okay? Uh, doctrine of humors died hard. Evolution is a dying religion and its adherents are running scared. Creationists don't do science because you can't test it. Well, creationists are not asking the taxpayers to pay for their view to be taught, so the burden of proof is on the evolutionist. Richard Dawkins said, it's absolutely safe to say if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. Well, Richard Dawkins has refused to debate creationists for many years. I was over in England two weeks ago. I'll debate him any time with half my brain tied behind my back, okay? If we stick with the scientific facts, tell him. We've already sent letters to him. Uh, Kenneth Miller, who teaches evolution and writes books about it, I debated him on the radio one time. He's a Catholic, writes a lot of textbooks about biology and evolution. He said, evolution is controversial in some circles. As if, well, only those people who are stupid don't, don't accept this wonderful revelation that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. <laughs> Karl Popper said, evolution is not a fact. It doesn't even qualify as a theory or hypothesis. It's a metaphysical research program. It's not testable science. Julian Huxley, Thomas Huxley's grandson, said, I suppose the reason why we leapt at the origin of species was that the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. Ooh, now we're getting to some truth here. If you don't want God telling you what to do, that's perfectly fine. I don't care if you obey God or not. You can live your life any way you want, but don't stand behind some flimsy religion called evolution and claim that justifies your, your rejection of the obvious that dogs produce dogs and cats produce cats and life begets life. There's no evidence for this evolution theory. Michael Ruse, professor of philosophy and zoology at University of Guelph, said evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than a mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian. But I must admit in this one complaint, and Mr. Gish is but one, to, one of many to make it, the literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it's true of evolution still today. Sir Arthur Keith, who wrote the foreword to Darwin's 100-year anniversary book, 18, 1959 edition to Darwin's book, Arthur Keith, who believed in evolution, said, Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. <laughs> Professor Bernard said, Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. The theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. So don't tell me that all scientists believe in evolution. You're simply mistaken, okay? Plus, it wouldn't be good logic to use that as an argument because majority opinion means nothing. The majority of the Taliban thought they did what, what was right, okay? <laughs> Malcolm Muggeridge said, I'm convinced that the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Posterity will marvel that so flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could accept it, be accepted with such incredible credulity that it has. How can people believe we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago? Scientists who go about teaching evolution are great con men. The story they are telling is the greatest, maybe the greatest hoax ever. In explaining evolution, we do not have one iota of fact. Fred Hoyle said the only way life could have come into existence is because some superintelligence having created it. So he says, well, maybe it came here from outer space. Well, you're transplanting the problem to a different place. How did it get started? That's not a solution. Pierre de Chardin, who was involved in the fraud of uh, Piltdown Man, okay, Catholic priest who promoted all kinds of false evidence to support the evolution theory. Pierre de Chardin said, evolution is a general postulate to which all theories, all hypotheses must henceforth bow in order to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light which illuminates all facts, which all lines of thought must follow. This is what evolution is. Talk about a mantra. That's a, that's a religious dogmatic statement. That's not science. Nobody's ever seen any evolution other than the micro changes we see within the same kind. My opponent asked for a testable hypothesis. Okay, here's my hypothesis. This world was created by an intelligent creator, and everything was created within a few days of each other. This is the only way to explain all the millions of symbiotic relationships we find in nature. Certain plants require certain animals. Certain animals require each other to transport seeds or whatever. If you want to think that these things evolve separately, you're welcome to do that. But I think it's more logical to say they're so complex they had to be designed. First of all, the design indicates there was a designer. And the complexity indicates there was a really intelligent designer. And the inter relation between all these plants and animals, including the fact that plants give off oxygen and animals give off CO2 and they reciprocate the gases, there are billions of examples that you would have to say it is best explained with a creation of these things 
fully formed and in close proximity to each other within a few days. Then I think there was a worldwide flood about 4,400 years ago that buried this world and produced billions and billions of fossils, which we're still digging up today. All of the fossils that we find are indication that there was a rapid burial, catastrophic burial, in enormous amounts of mud. There are layers of limestone that cover just about the entire United States. The fossil layers, that we, the layers of rock that we see, the so-called geologic column, by the way, the geologic column does not exist except in the imagination, but the layers of the rock that we see are best explained by being deposited very rapidly within a, just a few moments of each other, actually. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, running through multiple rock layers. People say these layers form separately over millions of years. I just don't think that's logical. Can you focus that just a little bit for me there, brother? Turn the outer one. Um, if somebody wants to believe that these layers form, you know, separately over millions of years, they're welcome to do that, but I think that the scientific evidence would say this is simply not true. Millions, maybe not millions, I know thousands and possibly even millions of petrified trees exist in the world standing up in the vertical position. They're all over the world. These fossilized trees are connecting all these different layers that they're telling us are different ages. So back in 1830, they started teaching the layers of the rock are different ages. And somebody swallowed that and started saying, oh, wow, well, then that means all the, this earth is millions of years old. The fact of the matter is the evidence we see from fossils, from digging in the ground, is you see petrified trees extending from one seam of coal right through 20 feet of rock into another seam of coal. They're found all over the world. Petrified trees in the vertical position are indications that these layers are not different ages. And yet my opponent here and his colleagues will dig in the dirt and find fossils and assume that because one fossil is lower than another one, therefore it is the ancestor of the one above it, which is totally flawed logic. I mean, if I get buried on top of a hamster, that does not prove he's my grandpa, okay? I think the petrified trees that we find in the vertical position, and there are th many thousands of them, are indication of rapid burial in mud. All over the world, petrified clams are found, found on top of mountains, huge clams in the closed position. They had to be buried quickly. They had to be buried alive, actually, because as soon as a clam dies, it opens. And yet petrified clams in the closed position are extremely common. I've got buckets of them in my museum in Pensacola, Florida. I like fossils. We have a museum. I don't know any Christians that are against science or that are against fossils. I think what's happening, though, is the interpretation that you're placing on these fossils is where the problem comes in. Let me get up to a problem here, uh, to the... Uh, in t what different ways things are interpreted. My family there, first grandkid, okay, okay. All right. Uh, uh, well, be quicker to find this way. Um, here's the problems. Students are shown facts, which, like for instance, it's a fact, Grand Canyon exists. I don't know anybody that argues with that, okay? But there are two interpretations of how it got there. Those folks who believe in evolution say the canyon formed slowly with a little bit of water and lots of time. Those who believe in creation say it formed quickly with lots of water and a little bit of time. Now, the fact is, the canyon exists. The interpretation is not part of the fact, necessarily, okay? It's a fact the Earth has layers of rock. The evolutionists say these layers form slowly over millions of years, and each one is a different age. I think we can demonstrate that's not true. The creationist says these layers are probably all from one big giant flood in the days of Noah. So my testable hypothesis, sir, is that there was a flood that formed all these layers in rapid succession. And we have evidence of this from trees connecting them all. We have evidence from... The fact that uh, Grand Canyon could not possibly have been formed by the Grand Can or could, could not possibly have been formed by the Colorado River. The top of Grand Canyon is six, seven or eight thousand feet above sea level in between the snow lines here. The river enters the canyon at 2,800 feet above sea level. Rivers don't flow uphill. How did it get started? It has to start at the top, eroding its way down. It's 270 miles across there. Grand Canyon is quite obviously a washed out spillway. There used to be a big lake there. And how students are being taught it was formed slowly by the Colorado River, and they get by with that and call it science, I don't know. But many, many geologists agree Grand Canyon was formed catastrophically. A couple of great big lakes, Grand Lake and Hopi Lake, overflowed their dams. Got too full, and any farmer that's ever lost a dam to too much water will tell you, it doesn't wash out the whole dam, it washes a slot out of it. Washes a crack out of the middle someplace, and that's what happened with Grand Canyon. The top of the canyon's higher than the bottom. The river runs through the bottom. The top's higher than the, where the river enters by 4,000 feet. Rivers don't flow uphill. There's no way that river made that canyon. But yet students are taught, Grand Canyon forms slowly over millions of years, and some of you are not checking the facts. I just encourage you students here, if you want to believe in evolution, that's perfectly fine. I don't care what you believe in. I'm going home tomorrow. But you believe whatever you want. But you need to examine the facts, the so-called facts that are being presented to you, because I'm telling you, I'm afraid some of you are being brainwashed and you're swallowing it. Yeah. 
And I think, I suspect, I know the reason why. It might be like Julian Huxley. You might like that evolution theory because it gives you freedom from the creator. Oh, well, that's, you just do whatever you want. But we'll see Judgment Day what happens. Thank you. We're now going to move on to a 15-minute rebuttal um, from Dr. Weisenberg. Well, I have nothing else to confirm what I said about the creationist attitude about the facts. Uh, look, what do we want? We want to have a lecture here about geology? Well, they'll bring in some geologists, right? We'll talk about, you know, the plate tectonics, and we'll talk about radioisotopes and the measure of radioisotopes. We'll talk about the actual fossils that are in those layers and how they, in fact, show a logical progression, historical progression, their history, a record of history, right? Now, I, you know, I've been to fossil beds. He's probably been there. You know, it's really amazing to see, for example, you can go up to Catskills as I've been. There's fossilized coral reefs. I mean, there are coral reefs in middle New York State. Now, I can explain that from the combination of, you know, uh, plate tectonics and evolution. There's no problem. We have the data, we have the ages, we have the mechanisms. It's all there. I can go a little further away and I can find beds of trilobite fossils, thousands and thousands of them, embedded in what was obviously mud at one time. You can, you can dig, and I would challenge my you know, opponent, you can dig all you want in those fossil beds. You can dig, you can dig, you can dig. You will never find a bony fish or any sign of anything that came afterwards. Okay? You can, he talks about dinosaurs. You know, the, the, the creationists love it because every now and then somebody will say they found a human footprint or something like that embedded with dinosaur fossils. Come on, there are thousands upon millions of dinosaur fossils. There are some 800, the, the Dinosaur National Park thinks about 500 square miles or something. It's huge. And it's millions of dinosaur fossils and other fossils dating back to 100 million or so years ago. You won't find a trace of a human remain. And so, you know, what the creationists do is they proclaim that certain things can't have happened. They say, oh, it doesn't make sense. It could not have happened. We've never seen this, right? And because they proclaim it, we are exposed to say, okay, we're just going to ignore all the evidence, ignore the geologists, ignore the physicists, ignore the chemists, ignore the paleontologists, because the creationists don't have the imagination or something, right? Well, I don't know what it is, because I don't have any problem understanding how slow change contains a single cell. And by the way, let me say something about the banana and the dog, right? Here's an interesting fact. If you take and look at what's inside those, that banana and those dogs, they're awfully similar. <laughs> it's cells. It's DNA. You know, you can take you can take a picture you can take a picture of a cell. Now we can tell looking at I can tell an animal cell from a plant cell. But if I get a, a, a an electron micrograph of an animal cell, for example, I can't tell if it comes from a worm or a person. All right? They're, they look the, basically the same. All right? The same parts. It's like, you know, it's like saying if you've got a bunch of a, a Lego set, all you can build is what's on the package, right? The little label on the package that shows you can build a, you know, a truck out of your Legos. No, you can build all kinds of things out of those Legos, okay? And the people who study this, who do the math, who do the computer programs, and in my, in my imagination, I have no problem seeing how you can do that in slow steps. 
And it's been shown that you can, in fact, do that. And the historical evidence says that's what happened. Now look, you know, this is, this is the book I use in my class. It's a skinny little book because I didn't want my students to have to pay too much money. Uh, you know, it happens to be full of tons of data. I, I will point out there's actually the peppered moth story is not in here. Uh, Henkel's diagrams are not in here, but there's a ton of data. There's a ton of experiments and, and diagrams and, I mean, you know, 100 and some 50 years of study of evolution, and it's still progressing. We still do it because you know why? We're scientists. He complains that, you know, things change, all we are making new discoveries. Hello, we're scientists. That's what we do. We study nature, right? And so far, except for creationists making proclamations that we're all wrong because they don't understand it or they have some different explanation, the evolutionary biology is the best we got. And until they can come up with something better, that's what we got to teach our kids. You teach the best science. Okay, um, now we're going to move on to a, a closing statement um, from each of the speakers. This, can be, this is a five-minute closing statement. If you just want to close with what you have to say there. And then after that, we'll do the questions. We'll take a little break after the conclusions. We can get the questions in order here. So you have to go to the bathroom or set, whatnot. You can do that quickly. And then uh, after about five minutes, after they conclude, we'll start with the questions. Um, quite a few things are obviously left hanging like it is in every debate I've ever done. But uh, this isn't time to cover everything. It's probably better to do point by point instead of minute by minute. But he mentioned about isotopes as evidence uh, for evolution. He's mentioned that several times tonight, actually. I'm assuming he's referring to carbon dating or potassium argon or uranium strontium, or, I mean, uranium to lead or lead 208 to lead 206 or uranium 235. There's quite a few. But here's an example of how things actually work in the real world, okay? Not the imaginationary world. Living mollusk shells were carbon dated 2,300 years old. Freshly killed seal carbon dated 1,300 years old. It just died. Shells from living snails carbon dated 27,000 years old. Proceedings of the 12th Nobel Symposium said, if a C14 date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it is not entirely contradicting, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we just drop it. Well, then uh, here more recently, uh, Anthropological Journal of Canada said, no matter how useful it is, the radiocarbon method is still not capable of yielding accurate, reliable results. There are gross discrepancies, the chronology is uneven and relative, and the accepted dates are actually selected dates. This whole blessed thing is nothing but 13th century alchemy. It all depends upon which funny paper you read. One part of a mammoth dated 29,000 years old, another part of the same animal dated 44,000 years old. We can go all day on this radiometric dating if you'd like to talk about that. In the last two years, an absolute date has been obtained for the Gandong beds. It has the very interesting value of 300,000 years, plus or minus. 300,000 years. Uh, we could talk a long time on that. We will not. Okay, uh, let's see. He also mentioned about plate tectonics. This is interesting. I think uh, students really ought to be shown this. Geology and earth science are one of my favorites. I taught earth science for many years. Um, let's just talk a little bit about Pangaea in the few minutes I have left here. See, if I had known about the five minutes, I would have had a little more stuff together. Okay, Pangaea. Students are taught that all the continents used to fit together. <clears throat> they say South America and Africa seem to be a perfect fit. Mm hmm Here's the evidence they used to support this theory. The shapes of the continents seem to fit. Similar fossils are found on opposite sides. And it's true, similar fossils are found on opposite sides of the ocean. It's also true that those same similar fossils are found all over the world. So this is, could be just as much evidence for a flood. Okay? He says there, they'll say there are magnetic reversals in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Here's what they don't tell you. They shrank Africa at least 35% in order to make them fit for your textbook. They took out all of Mexico and Central America. Hey, senor, que pasa? Donde esta Mexico? Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala. They also don't tell you that they twisted uh, two continents one way and one the other way. They also don't tell you what I think ought to be obvious to a kindergartner. If you take the water out of the oceans, you will notice there is dirt underneath. People say, do you think the continents were ever connected? Uh, what do you mean? They still are. What do you mean, were they? The low places are full of water, that's all. Okay, it's not... It's not like it's hollow under the oceans, you know, think about it. So, um, oh well, anyway, the, <clears throat> I, I like earth science. I don't question the fact that the plates are moving, okay? I've been to the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault, none of my fault, but I've been there, done that, studied it, okay? 
there's no question the plates are moving. The question is, can you interpret this little bit of movement we see over billions of years and make some kind of conclusions from it? I think you're going to have to jump from science to religion when you do that. You're going to take a little bit of evidence that we see, you know, something moving just a little bit, which is true, and it causes earthquakes and volcanoes, and I'm familiar with all of that. But that doesn't prove it's been going for billions of years. I would encourage you students to open your mind just a little bit and think about possibly, it could be, just like when people were taught the earth was flat, and later they found out, oops, that's wrong. And somebody taught, oh, well, big rocks fall faster than little rocks, because Aristotle says so. That was taught for 2,000 years, and it's wrong. And some of you are being taught in this university that you evolved from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. Well, it's wrong. You were designed by an all-wise, super-intelligent creator who loves you and would like to forgive your sin and take you to heaven, but if you want to go to hell, that's your business, okay? We'll now uh, move on and give Dr. Weisenberg five minutes to conclude. Okay. Well, here we are. Uh, I, I, when, when, I, uh, when I was I was communicating about this with uh, a colleague, and I said uh, I was going to be engaged in this debate, I referred to myself as the sacrificial lamb, uh, and I suspect that I am because obviously most of you are here. Yes, well, and I and I accept my role. Uh, you know. People, of course, are entitled to believe anything they want, and I accept that. I don't have any problem with that. And the scientists of the world who study these things are going to continue to do evolution. They're going to continue to do geology. They're going to continue to do physics. They're going to continue in the, in the, the battles that rage constantly in science over the interpretation. You know, plate tectonics was not something that just popped up. You know, it was something that was proposed, ignored, and then, all of a sudden, gee, pieces fell together. The pieces came together. And that's what scientists look at. They look at all the pieces. What the creationists do, you know, they love to say, oh, it was the big flood, and then they'll pick out some selective data, not, you know, you mentioned the reversals of the Earth's magnetic field, which was the actual evidence by which we established plate tectonics. I don't remember anything in the Bible about reversal of the Earth's magnetic field. I don't know. Maybe it's there. But uh, so, you know, you've got to, what you've got to understand. Those of you that are, and it's obvious that most of you here came here to, to uh, from to hear Dr. Hovind. Uh, keep this in mind that you rely on science, and you rely on science for the world we, as scientists, have created for you, right? It's a, it's a pretty nice world. We put, we put together a lot of great things in this world. We've cured a lot of diseases. We've created some great artifacts from, you know, video games, the big screen TV, the fast cars. Take your pick, you know, or maybe those aren't great things. But science does that, right? It's given us antibiotics. It's given us heart transplants. Now, you can believe what you want, but scientists are going to continue to do science. They're going to continue to study the world. They're going to continue to debate and argue with each other about what the evidence shows. And until the creationists can offer better explanations, can give, come up with some mechanisms that offer actual, believable results, because I'm sorry, you know, the, the hand-waving you saw doesn't pass for real science. The real scientists, the real scientists are the ones getting their hands dirty, working in the lab, and, and I'm sorry, it's not just numbers. It's a matter of respect. I respect the people who come here who are religious and have deep, deep beliefs in their religion, and I think that's great. And I'm not going to come up in here, for example, and, and argue that God doesn't exist and give you a list of reasons why God doesn't exist. Because, you know, you, you know that he does, right? She does. Excuse me. You know that she does. And, and, I'm and, and frankly, we shouldn't be having that debate. Let the scientists do their science and let 
Whichever religion it is you belong to, do whatever it does, have your faith, enjoy it, cherish it, cherish it, but let us scientists do our work and have our fights and have our arguments and let our children learn the best science. Thank you. This is about um, vestigial organs. It says um, male nipples, which include the milk-making mammary tissues, as women, um, but they don't. But men don't make milk. Explain their function if they're not vestigial. Explain the function of nipples on men if they're not vestigial. Is that the question? Yes. Uh, first place, I would point out that if there were a vestigial structure, that is lousy evidence for evolution. That's an example of losing something, not gaining something. Evolution ought to have some examples where we gain something. So your question was, is, why isn't this example of evolution? Was that what the, was the question there? Yeah. Okay, so I am answering the question, thank you. Um, now, I, uh, as far as the function, there's quite a few different types of skin on the human body. Ask anybody who ever does skin grafting after, for burn victims, they will tell you there are different types of skin, and they have to be um, graft, you have to graft carefully to get the right type of skin in the right place, okay? Or you may have problems where it won't take, even from the same body, transplanting from one part of your body to another for skin grafting. There are several different types of skin that end right where the nipples are on anybody's body. Several different types of skin. The skin on the side of your body is different than the skin on the front of your body, the chest. So I don't know all the functions of it or the purposes of it, but I think that I would point out that the, the, their, the art, that question shows uh, enormous faith in evolution, uh, totally devoid of facts, because there is, there is no, that, that's, that is not evidence for evolution. Vestigial organs would not count as evidence. It is simply a matter, and it's not vestigial, by the way, nearly all ma male mammals have these things, and whether they serve a function for transition from one type of skin to another, or for probably other, several things we, um, uh, several other purposes have been proposed, I won't get into all that now, but uh, I think, that, that I, I think that there probably are reasons for it, but I think if you look at this historically, 200 years ago, scientists had a list of nearly 180 vestigial organs. They said you don't need your appendix, you don't need your tonsils, you don't need your adenoids, you don't need your pituitary gland, you don't need your thyroid gland, you don't need your thymus gland. They had 180 vestigial organs on the list. And that was supposed to be evidence for evolution. One by one, those things get plucked off the list as we realize the function of that, okay? so. I would say, state my case and say that uh, even if we don't know all of the functions of a particular uh, uh, organ or design, then that still is not evidence for evolution. In fact, it's just indication we need to study more. There are other functions we probably should not get into, other po possible uh, purposes you know, we should not get into in a, uh, maybe in a college classroom we could. Okay. 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 And now we're going to move on to a question for Dr. Weisenberg. And the question is, um, how does the fossil record prove evolution? And how did the origin of life begin? Okay, that's actually two questions. Okay, two questions, and I'm going to answer the following way. First of all, fossils don't prove evolution. Okay? The fossil record is consistent with a story, a historical pattern, right? And that's exactly what paleontologists work at. They try and place the fossils in order according to the kinds of data that they accumulate, which involve a variety of kinds of evidence, geological evidence, chemical evidence, physical evidence. And you will see, because I follow this, they fight, boy, do they fight. They fight bitterly over exactly where this fossil should go or that fossil should go, over exactly the kinds of transitions Right? Because that's what scientists do. Okay? But the always, because evolution has reached such a high level of reliability in that wherever you see that argument, you don't see somebody coming in and saying, oh, this, evolu this particular fossil is inconsistent with evolution. Because that just doesn't happen. That just hasn't happened. And therefore, it's not an issue. Okay? Secondly, about the second question, because there was two questions, when I teach this, I don't even talk about, I may mention origin of life once or twice. My textbook has uh, a half a page on the origin of life. Uh, it's a big mystery. I wish I knew. There are several theories about the processes that might have, would some, sometimes called chemical evolution. Uh, 
whether it's the thermal vents or clays or RNA organisms, we don't know. I guess, I don't think we're ever going to know for sure because I don't think we're going to have a time machine to go back and look and the, the, the traces of what happened three and a half billion years ago are simply gone. Science is, deals with the real world of real evidence and we just never going to know. Okay, but it has, but that's, that's separate from the issue of, uh, I tell my students this, I've done this in my class, uh, my beginning class, none majors, I say, look, if you want to believe in creation, fine, believe in the creation of the first living cell, and I have no problem with that, because scientifically, I don't have any better, I don't have any really better scientifically, I don't happen to believe that, but I'll accept, if you want to, if you want to argue, say, hey, it was created, the first living thing was, a, was an act of divine creation, as long as you accept the facts, as I understand them, from all the various scientific studies three and a half billion years ago and the, and the transitions that happened afterwards, fine. That's, your, that's no problem for me as a scientist. And this person says, I'm still waiting for physical evidence and verifiable facts that your God exists, aside from the Bible which humans wrote. If I understand the question correctly, you're asking for verifiable evidence that my God exists. I think that uh, design demands a designer. If I was walking through the woods and found a painting hanging on a tree, and I looked around and could find no evidence of a human ever having been there, no footprints, no evidence at all, I would still conclude there was a painter. If I was walking through the beach, along the beach, and I found, you know, John loves Mary written in the sand, I would never dream that the waves did that. I would assume that because these sand molecules or grains are arranged in a particular order, they are designed to give a message. So I would conclude that there was some, some level of intelligence here that uh, created this. Now, that would depend on how intelligent Mary and John are, but uh, there's some level of intelligence here. Devi design always demands a designer. A painting testifies there was a painter whether you ever see him or not. A building is proof there was a builder. When we dig through the ground and we find evidence of an ancient civilization, if you start in archaeology, you're digging down in the ground and you find some stones arranged in a circle. They conclude, somebody did it. Because this is obvious, it doesn't happen as a natural thing. And the archaeologists look at this all the time, and they, they see evidence in the, in the ground for a human designer. Why we can't look at the world we see in the, through the microscope or the telescope or our eyeballs and see that there is a designer, the, the evidence is shouting at us. The watch is proof there was a watchmaker. Now, some people don't like that idea because if there's a designer, then there might be some rules. And that's really what they're running from. Creation itself is evidence of a creator. I don't have to see the watchmaker to believe he exists. When I was in Japan a year ago, I did not get to see the guy who made the Casio data bank watch. But I believe there was one. I never saw the guy who designed this. As far as I know, this is the world's largest rock group. But... <clears throat> You can ask any evolutionist, say, fellas, and I like asking the question, I'll say, do you think there's, is there any possibility in b trillions of years that these faces could appear on this rock by chance natural processes like exfoliation or thermal expansion or, you know, uh, erosion or wind abrasion? They'll say, no, it's probably not going to happen. One chance in maybe you know, a couple of gazillion. Okay. And yet they think that George Washington himself with 50 trillion cells in his, in his complex body happened by chance. Well, you're welcome to believe that, but that's not logical, and it's not science. It's pure religion, and they need to simply admit that. So they're always avoiding the design argument in the textbooks. They say plants are adapted to their environment. Gills are an adaptation to living in water. Well, how did they adapt before? How did they live before they adapted the gills? Hmm? Oh, for millions of years, they all died. None of them lived. <laughs> yeah. They don't use the word design because textbooks avoid using the word design because that automatically leads to the logical conclusion, hey, who's the designer, okay? My watch holds 300 phone numbers. It's a calculator, stopwatch, alarm clock, and a countdown timer. It does not tell time. I have to look at it. But <laughs> there had to be a designer. You don't have to meet the designer to believe he exists. The creation is proof there was a creator. People say, where's the evidence for God? I say, do you have to light a candle to see the sun? I mean, look around. 
How you can study biology and not see an incredible amount of design from the molecular level, through the cellular level, through the tissue, organ level, through the entire structure, of, through the interrelationship of symbiosis relationships, through the universe, the planets, you know, going around the sun and the, the incredible mathematics behind all this. Most of the great scientists of the first a few hundred years of science were creationists looking for some way to figure out the mind of the designer. Science ought to bring us to the creator. It's obvious. I see design. I conclude designer. I think it is totally illogical to walk through the woods and find a painting and say, I can't see the painter so he doesn't exist. And that's what evolutionists are doing. Okay. The next question for Dr. Weisenberg is, show us one transitional fossil that exists or a, a proof of a, of a transitional fossil. Oh, the transitional fossil story. Look, here's, here's the harsh reality. There are many, many, many transitional fossils. They're in the, they're in the museums. Go look at them. Oh, I didn't happen to have one in my pocket. I'm sorry. Did you bring that? Uh, answer my question. Now look, you know, every time something comes up, it, I, you know, I had this, this sort of debate not so, so long ago, and I, of course you mentioned Arche Archaeopteryx, which is a feathered dinosaur fossil, or a feathered, a bird with teeth in its beak and dinosaur-like features. And of course, oh, that's a bird, oh, that's a dinosaur. Well, look, what professional paleontologists do is they examine the details of the bone structure, they examine the teeth, they examine the ear bones, they examine, and what they tr do with that data is they create as best they can the pattern of change. And you can go into any journal of paleontology, and there's lots of them, and you can look at that data if you're so inclined. There that's what paleontologists do for a living. They work out those transitions. Okay? Now, the other thing about paleontologists in that job, it's awfully hard work for a very simple reason. When these events happen, the transitions happen, evolutionary theory tells us it happens in a very small population. It's not an impossible way it could happen. All right? So there are some mutations, there's some combination of mutations, in a small population, proves the fitness. The chances of finding those fossils are, in fact, it's, it's hard, but they do find them. There are millions of them. No, I didn't bring you one, but if you like, sign up. We'll go to the museum together. We'll look at them, okay? That's not, you know, I'm sorry. Look, what do you do with a feathered dinosaur? I don't know what to do with it. And by the way, yeah, there was a fraud, but after the fraud, Jill and Feathered Dinosaur, there were several discoveries that are absolutely bona fide of feathered dinosaurs. So, you know, that's just the way it is. And I'll say one thing also about this designer thing. I've been to the White Mountains. You ever see the old man of the mountain in the White Mountains? Yeah. I guess that was that the same designer. Uh, you know, you can, in fact, you do see structures appearing by chance. And what evolution does is it selects those that work. That's all it does. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is um, we're going to change it a little bit. We're going to have to, we're going to let them answer the question. We're also going to uh, let the other speaker re re rebute their answer to the question just a minute or two after 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 the question is asked. Um, how do you explain the formation of granites within a creation time frame? How do I explain the formation of granites? Uh, I'm not sure that anyone has been able to demonstrate the granite um, formation. I know that if you melt granite and then let it cool back down, it does not reform into granite. Um, there have been quite a few studies on granite. Uh, I think it's interesting to see that in granite we find some pretty amazing things. Uh, called radiopolonium halos, uh, if I had a second, I would get to that. Um, but these radiopolonium halos, uh, Robert Gentry was one of the world's experts on the disposal of radioactive waste. He worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories in uh, 
Knoxville, Tennessee area there. And um, let's see. I think it's right here. Okay. Uh, radio polonium halos. I have over 5,000 pictures in PowerPoint, so it would help if you would ask the questions in the same order that I have the answers. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it'd be a little quicker anyway. Is polonium halos on here? Halos. Was the Earth a hot molten mass? There we go. Okay, good. Uh, granites are a very interesting rock. Uh, Robert Gentry did quite a collection, has quite a huge collection. Actually, I've been to his laboratory in, in Tennessee. Um, the Bible says pretty clearly the Earth was created and it was underwater, which means it was never a hot molten mass, whereas the evolution theory teaches the Earth was hot, a hot molten mass, and it slowly cooled down. These are clearly contradictory. Somebody is obviously wrong. Either the Earth was hot or the Earth was never hot, a hot molten mass anyway on the surface. Robert Gentry's website is halos.com if you want to get all the details on that. In the laboratory, under the microscope, they've discovered, looking at granites, they see all sorts of little radio polonium halos, which is kind of like a hand grenade going off in a huge block of jello would produce a ring, a halo, that would, the fragments would be suspended in the jello. Of course, we don't see this in, in water because the water, the fragments fall apart. We don't see the 4th of July fireworks make their ring and then stay there in the air because they all fall down. Uh, but in granite, we find these halo uh, polonium, polonium halos indicating the rock was never a hot molten mass because these, these halos would have flowed away. They have, polonium has a very short half-life, anywhere from 64 thousandths of a second to two minutes, I think. So the existence of these halos is really a mystery to those who believe the rock was a hot molten mass. And I think you'll find, if you go to the website halos.com, you'll find lots of evidence on this. Robert Gentry published in major, major magazines. Science journals published his stuff for years until somebody realized, ooh, do you realize this proves the Big Bang Theory is wrong? And his research funding was uh, shut off like a spigot because anything that doesn't go with the evolution theory will not be supported. Just like if a teacher stood up in the Soviet Union 10 years ago and said, I don't believe in communism, they would find themselves out of a job. And if a teacher in this university said, I don't believe in evolution, they probably would find themselves out of a job. There is not academic freedom in places like this. Okay, go ahead. Would you like to give a rebuttal to that at all? Okay. We'll move on to the next question to uh, Dr. Weisenberg. And uh, the question is, in Dr. Hoven in his uh, presentation, this proved the geologic column and the Big Bang Theory. Um, do you believe that the Big Bang Theory and the geological column, if they were false, that evolution could still be true? And if not, why did you not defend them? Okay, look, first of all, I am not a cosmologist, okay? There are, I, I, I actually had a roommate who was an uh, astrophysicist once, if that helps. Uh, there are cosmologists who have theories about the origin of the universe. They've made predictions about, for example, what would happen if they looked up at the infrared radiation. Those predictions are confirmed. Okay, fine. That's what science does. That's what creationists do not do, right? Can creationism explain the infrared background? I don't think so, okay? Now, there are other theories. There is now a nice the super string theory of the origin of the universe that I've become aware of recently, and I don't know which is true. There's multiple universe theories. There's a the whole anthropomorphic principle in the cosmology. That's, that's for those few folks who do that science, okay? Every time the creationists approach this problem, they want to insist that issues of origin and abiogenesis are somehow related to evolution, right? And they're not, and we tell them they're not. We tell them over and over and over again that issues such as the origin of life, the origin of the universe, are not related to the issue of evolution by natural selection. Those are entirely unrelated processes, and they are like brain dead on that. I don't know, if I had a student who couldn't understand that concept, I would flunk him outright. I can only tell you that, okay? Dr. Hoven, would you like to give a rebuttal to that? Could you read the question one more time? There's part of it I wanted to get. Who had that? It was um, in Dr. Hoven's presentation, he disproved the geologic column and the Big Bang Theory. Do you believe that the Big Bang Theory and the geological column, since they're being proven false, can evolution still be true? 
I think the Big Bang Theory is not even a good theory. It's a hypothesis. It does not explain a lot of things. It does not explain the origin of time, the origin of space, or the origin of matter, all three of which have to exist, uh, have to be coexistent and come into existence at, the, existence at the same time. If you have matter but no space to put it in, then where would you put it? If you have matter and space but no time, then when would you put it? Ma time, space, and matter is called a continuum. They have to come into existence simultaneously, and the Bible covers that in one verse with ten words in it. In the beginning, that's time, God created the heaven, that's space, and the earth, representing matter. God created time, space, and matter all at the same time. And there's no other way to work. Uh, I don't, I, I've never met the guy that made this computer. This computer is purely natural components. I mean, there's not a little man running around in there changing the numbers on the screen. But, and it works on natural processes. But the fact of the matter is the guy who created the computer is not in the computer. He's outside of the computer, above and beyond the computer, okay? And the, guy, the God who designed this world is above and beyond this world. He's not locked into the same laws that we are. He's not locked into the laws of time, space, and matter. He created those things. He can be right now in yesterday or today or tomorrow. He can be right now at all places at all times simultaneously. So that's the God that I worship anyway. So I see no evidence whatsoever. Uh, I've not seen any evidence presented tonight. I was going to try to find the slide. Like I said, I've got 5,000. I couldn't find it. Evolution is like a shell game where they put the, peas, put the pea under the, uh, under the nut, you know, and they move them around and try to get you confused. Oh, which, which one's got the pea? The geologist is always saying, well, the, the, the biologist has the, ev has the evidence. And the biologist says, oh, no, the anthropologist has it. And there's no pea under any of them. Nobody has the evidence. <laughs> in mud by nose blood. I think there's ample evidence that oil, I think, I don't think you'll find a lot of argument, if you get me on, okay, uh, I don't think you'll find a lot of argument about the oil formation, that it had to be from um, natural sources, okay, this textbook, for instance, says, uh, the formation of both uh, oil and natural gas here uh, is from the decay of organisms that once lived in the sea, they are changed by heat and pressure into oil. Scientists can make oil pretty quickly in the laboratory. Uh, there's an article in uh, the U.S. Department of Interior Bureau of Mines, clear back in 1971, where they made oil in 20 minutes out of organic waste. In Australia, they have a, a factory that takes sewage sludge and produces oil in 30 minutes. So it can be done very quickly. Sinclair Gas Company has the dinosaur as their logo because they say the dinosaurs turned to oil. Uh, it was, used to be called opaline oil, then became Sinclair. Uh, they say it mellowed for 80 million years. Well, I disagree. I think the oil formed very quickly during the flood in the days of Noah, when thousands and billions actually of plants and animals and things were buried. The, the way to explain the fossil fuels that we have, be they oil or natural gas or coal, those were all formed during the flood, I believe, because they all require rapid burial. Some people have tried to propose that maybe coal comes from um, a peat bed. I was just in, uh, been in Ireland and North Ireland and uh, Wales here recently. And, um, there's a lot of peat over there. You can dig up your ground, dig up your yard, let it dry out, and burn it. It'll burn. It's very highly organic. It's a substance called peat. However, peat, as it gets compacted over the years, always has thousands, if not millions, of little root canals through them where other some, some, something grew on top. When you look at coal, you do not find these root canals in the coal. Those who study coal, I think, will tell you that the coal had to form. I've got pictures on that here. Let's see. Coal formation. There we go. Um, coal had to form very quickly uh, by probably huge mats of vegetation that are buried under deep sediments. Coal can also be produced in a few hours. Um, in organic chemistry book here in 1984, they talked about how coal can be formed in 36 weeks, heating at just 250 degrees centigrade. You raise the temperature, the time goes down. Coal can be formed rather quickly. I think the best explanation for the coal that we find in the world is during the flood in the days of Noah, there were huge vegetation fields floating around. Trees would get uprooted. They would float for years, like the Mount St. Helens. I just flew down to Mount St. Helens uh, Spirit Lake a few months ago. They have oh, several million trees were blown into that lake. About 20,000 have now sunk to the bottom. The rest are still floating. It's been 22 years they're still floating there. As they float around, they're going to drop off uh, lots of vegetation. And during the flood in the days of Noah, you would drop off, you know, vegetation fields as it drifts by. A few weeks later, it comes past again. By now, there are layers of sediment in between. And I think the best explanation for this strip mines that we find, coal is nearly always found in layers. 
and it does not have the root penetration from another forest growing on top of it. It's just simply, you know, solid rocks of, of vegetation packed with no root penetration. So I don't think it, it's logical to say that coal formed from peat. I think it's more logical to say the existence of coal, um, and there are monstrous coal fields in the world, okay? I was in Spokane, Washington yesterday. There is a giant coal field just near there that is 10,000 square miles of coal 200 feet thick, containing all sorts of trees that are petrified, running all sorts of different angles. Uh, the best explanation for coal formation is a flood. The best explanation for oil formation is a flood when organisms that are living are buried real deep under enormous amounts of pressure. They can, it can be done in the laboratory in a few hours. It takes a lot of heat and or pressure. That would be best explained by several thousand feet of mud and sediments and rocks being deposited on top of zillions of dead things. So I think the evolution theory is totally devoid of any scientific way to explain the formation of coal or oil in their slow, gradual, natural processes. There are enormous amounts of oil and coal in the ground, indicating the world before the flood was very different than we have today, with probably lots more trees and lots more people and lots more animals. Today the Earth is 70% underwater. Only 3% of the Earth's surface is habitable for mankind. Much of its deserts, tundra, ice caps, uninhabitable. So I think that what the Bible says God created the earth to be inhabited. So my theory would be that the original creation had a lot more trees and plants and people when the flood came than we do today. And so probably if we dig in the ground, we're going to find oil and coal and natural gas from these decaying organisms. That would be a testable hypothesis. Okay? Thank you. I guess I get it. Do you have any debate for this? Well, I mean... You know, this is one of these things. You can go, you can read in Scientific American the responses to, to this stuff. You know, what can I say? You've got professional geologists who work for oil and coal companies. And trust me, they don't buy into this flood thing. And the people, the poor miners who are stuck hundreds of feet underground in the, in the coal act, mine accident recently in, uh, in Pennsylvania probably were would be a little puzzled to learn how that coal got placed hundreds of feet underground, right? So, and, and in such thick layers, as he says. So, you know, I, I just, I'm, just, I'm always amazed by the creationists who are all of a sudden instant experts on things I wouldn't even pretend to be an expert about. Geology, oil geology, coal geology. Now, you know, we had this little dis discussion earlier about who do you trust. Uh, I didn't wear my button. I was tempted. I have a big button that says, trust me, I'm a scientist. And I thought that little bit of self humor might not have been understood. But, you know, at some point in time, you either have to believe one or two things. Either all of the scientists that study all of these various aspects of the natural world have somehow lost their collective minds or intelligence or they're part of some conspiracy, they're afraid of losing their jobs. I don't know what all, but there they are. They're publishing articles every week. Thousands of articles come out, all of which are consistent with the same evolutionary picture. And apparently they're just all deluded. I don't know what else to say, but I can't sit up here, you know, the creationists will come out because they, they ignore any real facts, and they'll come out with some hypothetical that can be easily, easily disproved, but not by me at this instance, because what do you have to do? You have to study geology. You have to study paleontology. You have to study genetics and molecular biology and anatomy and astronomy, okay? And I actually happen to trust most of those people that publish in those areas. I think they're probably pretty smart guys and pretty decent scientists. And I trust them a hell of a lot more than I trust creationists who's never specialized in any of those fields. Okay, we have a, another question for Dr. Weisenberg here. And uh, the question is, in, in his uh, presentation, Dr. Hoven used facts to disprove evolution. He used, um, he, he used, uh, Please be quiet. He used, he used, he used um, the facts to disprove evolution, and according to the scientific method, if the, if the facts that are found disprove the hypothesis, the hypothesis is supposed to be thrown out. So if, if these facts do truly disprove evolution, then it doesn't, according to the scientific method, it should be thrown out. Oh, absolutely. If the facts disprove evolution, 
I'll abandon it in a microsecond. Okay? Uh, I didn't hear any facts disproving evolution. I didn't hear a single fact disproving evolution. And it made some statements about trees and rock and, and embedded like a few. I, I don't know anything about trees and rocks. I'm not a, 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 a geologist that studies trees and rocks. And neither is he. And, and you know, the fact of the matter is the people who do the geology, right, have developed those time scales based upon a variety of evidence. You know, I would have happily, happily, I'll tell you what, here's the deal, all right? I'll give him an I'll, axe and a shovel, and he can, and I'll take him up to a place where there's fossil beds of trilobites dating back, well, oh, say 500 million years ago, all right? If he can find a single more advanced form of life in that fossil bed, a bony fish, a clam, I mean, I'm not asking for anything very fancy. Plain old clam will do it. Any old fish. If he could find in that fossil bed, clearly marine aquatic deposit. I mean, you can't argue these guys are not aquatic creatures. If he could find a single, just one, embedded in that rock, hey, I'll abandon evolution. Right on the spot. Okay? And you know what? Go for it. Do it. But no, they don't, creationists don't have that kind of evidence, and they never will, because they're, they're wrong, that's all. Yeah. all right. Well, I think you need to be reading some of the same scientific, scientific literature, uh, because these type of things have been found frequently, and I can get into that in a minute. But Darwin said, if my theory be true, then numberless intermediate varieties must have existed. You've stated several times tonight that there are thousands of missing links. Um, this textbook says, since Darwin, many of these links have been found. Today, Darwin's theory is almost universally accepted by scientists. So, but David Ropp said, <coughs> who's a famous evolutionist, uh, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Berlinski said, there are gaps in the fossil graveyards, places where there should be intermediate forms, but where there is nothing whatsoever instead. No paleontologist writing in English, French, or German denies that this is so. This is simply a fact. Darwin's theory and the fossil record are in conflict. Um, according to Stephen Gould at Harvard, arthropods are the largest animal group. Where did they come from? What's their origin? As Darwin noted in The Origin of Species, the abrupt emergence of arthropods in the fossil record during the Cambrian presents a problem for evolutionary biology. There are no obvious simpler or intermediate forms, either living or in the fossil record. American scientist. Where did the fossil fish come from? Yet the transitions from spineless invertebrates to the first backboned fishes is still shrouded in mystery and many theories abound. Where did the birds come from? The true origin of birds is still up in the air, Alan Fiducia says. He's an atheist and ornithologist at uh, uh, North Carolina, Duke University, I think, or one of the universities in North Carolina. Okay, what about whales? The Confidence Encyclopedia in 96 said the evolutionary origin of whales remains controversial among zoologists. What about flowering plants? The origin of the angiosperms, an abominable mystery to Darwin, remains so 100 years later and is little better today. Both the origin of life and the origin of major groups of animals remains unknown. So if you're telling us there are fossil intermediates, you are either confused by something somebody told you, or you're deliberately lying to these students because the experts say there are not intermediate fossils. Okay? Now, Luther Sunderland was asked, asked the question to many major paleontologists, where is the evidence for evolution? You mentioned you would take us to a museum and see one, okay? The largest museum in the world, the largest fossil collection in the world, is the British Museum of Natural History. Colin Patterson was the curator of the fossil collection. Quarter million fossils on display. Luther Sunderland asked Colin Patterson, he said, Mr. Patterson, I read your book about evolution, but I noticed you didn't show us any intermediate fossils. You didn't show us any missing links. Where are they? Here was Patterson's response. I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line, there is not one such fossil. Yeah. Now you students, listen carefully. Don't believe a professor that tells you there are missing links. There aren't any. The whole chain is missing, okay? 
Stephen Gould said the absence of fossil evidence is a problem for evolution. Yeah, I guess it is. They got a great theory. They liked the theory. If only we had the evidence. That's why guys like Richard Goldschmidt, uh, Joe, Joe, you invited me to speak and invited him to speak, okay? Will you get take care of this uh, person who can't control himself, okay? If you want to get your own crowd, you go get your own crowd, okay? But you are not the speaker tonight, so shut up. <laughs> Richard, Richard Goldschmidt said 50, 60 years ago, the first bird hatched from a reptilian egg. Stephen Gould and Niles Eldridge have resurrected this stupid idea with the new theory called punctuated equilibrium, which basically is the same thing, with a new coat of paint on it, that we don't see any evidence for evolution because it happened so quickly. Well, this is what they're saying is, we don't have any evidence, so that's, that proves it happened. Basically, there are two theories about evolution. One is called gradualism, and the other is called punctuated equilibria. This textbook says, uh, which theory best describes the organism's evolution, gradualism or punctuated equilibria? And they tell the students to think critically. Well, students, if you want to think critically, you want to really analyze maybe neither of those is correct. You see, according to the evolutionists, there are only two choices. Evolution happens slowly, like Darwin said, or evolution happened quickly, like Gould said. If they do not seem to be capable of thinking outside the box. Maybe it didn't happen at all. There's no fossil evidence for either theory. And plus, fossils wouldn't count anyway. All we find is fossil evidence is proof of a flood that destroyed these creatures in catastrophic uh, burial position. Thank you so much. What do you have to prove um, the flood as a scientific fact, and where could all of that water come from? Okay. Where did the water come from, and what evidence is there? This was the first part of the question again. Um, well, how could you prove the flood as a scientific fact? I don't know that I could prove the flood as a scientific fact, but I didn't get into the uh, finish up the coal part here. Um, the Do Eugenia Scott, uh, president of the National Science Education Foundation uh, for their people that you know, have a national organization, she said, Dr. Hovind, there are 80 separate layers of coal in the Midwest. She's right, by the way. She said, if you take a look at the amount of coal in the world, the entire biomass of the world today could not possibly be converted to that much fossil fuel. She's right again. What she says is, there's so much coal in the ground, there aren't enough trees on the surface of the earth today to create it again. I agree. She said there had to have been an enormous amount of time involved in the laying down of the coal seams. Ooh, now right there, she's wrong. It's true there are enormous masses of coal in the world. This giant Powder River Basin coal in Wyoming uh, and, and um, goes down into uh, Montana and Wyoming in that area. There are hundreds of dinosaur footprints found in coal mines, for instance, in the ceilings of these coal mines. Pretty strange. Also, human artifacts are occasionally found in coal. For instance, um, not in this coal mine, but in a mine in West Virginia, Mr. Newton Anderson broke open a lump of coal and found this gold bell inside, completely encased in coal. Now, from a creationist perspective, this is not a problem. Humans were around before, before coal formed. The students are taught in school that the, the coal formed 250 million years ago in the Carboniferous era which, is, era, which is pure imagination. The fact of the matter is when you find human artifacts found in places where they're not supposed to be, like the coastal artifact, um, or the gold chain found by the lady in the lump of coal in, 19, in 1891, or the carved stone found in a lump of coal in the Webster mine in Iowa from the uh, uh, Daily News of Omaha, Nebraska, or this iron pot found inside a lump of coal in uh, uh, Thomas, Oklahoma. When you find human artifacts in coal, you ought to make a question that maybe what you're being taught is not correct. The sole of a shoe from Nevada was found, 1922, American Weekly Magazine said the stitching with pattern was clearly visible, including the twist of the thread. And the rock was 213 to 248 million years old. This is a clear case where somebody's preconceived acceptance of an evolutionary theory is an obvious hindrance to any intelligent research. When you find a sole of a shoe in a lump of coal, you ought to conclude humans were there at the time the coal was formed. To me, that doesn't take any brains to figure that out. But um, as far as not finding... Um, Oh, we're going to run out of time here. Fossils, um, the second part of the question I missed. I forgot it already. What was it? Where'd the water come from? I think there are three sources for the water in the time of the flood of the days of Noah. 
The Bible says the earth, had, uh, the earth was founded upon the seas. It was actually, there was more water in or under the crust of the earth. Today, there's still, the Japanese scientists a few weeks ago just published in a magazine that there's probably more water in the deep crust of the earth now than there is on the surface right now. More water in the earth than on the earth and all the oceans together. That would take me a minute to get to that. Uh, but the, the three, three sources for the water, I would say, according to scripture, would be there was water above the atmosphere, according to Genesis 1.29. I can find that one real quick. And then there was water under the crust of the earth, again, according to uh, uh, Psalm 133 and Psalm um, 136, I mean, and I'll show you here. Uh, let's see. Water under the crust of the earth. There we go. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Psalm 36 says, He stretched out the earth above the waters. I think the original creation had a layer of water overhead to protect them, which is the only way you can possibly explain the existence of giant fossils that are found, uh, giant fossil cockroaches that are 18 inches long that simply can't survive today. Giant fossil insects of all kinds are found. Giant fossil reptiles called dinosaurs are found. These, and giant humans. These things would thrive in the pre-flood conditions when there was water above the atmosphere. This water all came down at the time of the flood in the days of Noah, and the water underneath came to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. So all of the water for the flood came from up above or down inside, and it's still here. People say, where did the water for the flood go? Well, it's still here. The oceans are gigantic. I flew over to Pacific, and I told one of the guys in my office, I said, man, the Pacific Ocean is huge. He said, oh, that's just the top of it. That's a powerful thought. There's enough water in the oceans right now to cover this entire planet nearly two miles deep. There's plenty of water out there to cover the world. I think that after the flood, the Bible teaches pretty clearly that the mountains arose, the valleys sank down, the crust of the earth flexed up and down, the high places became mountains, the water rushed off and became oceans, and the water for the flood is still here. There's an awful lot of earth, planet earth, that's basically wasted real estate underwater as far as humans are concerned. And they're finding all sorts of cities underwater. A 30, 40, 50 feet of water, 150 feet in the Black Sea, cities found. I cover all that in my seminar part six of how do you explain these underwater cities. And the water level was lower because the ice caps were bigger, but that's a seminar part six all about the, the flood, what caused it. Okay, shut it off there. Would you like to have a rebuttal? That was really bizarre. That's the best <laughs> I've ever seen. You know, uh, look, one can wave one's hands, he can quote all the, the people he wants to quote who at one time or another may have said something or said something else. Science works in a certain way. Testable hypothesis, all right? Now, he, he's made some claims, fine, he can make, can make all those claims. Just, oh, this, this is because, you know, the coal comes from, you know, it was there when humans were there because well, there's artifacts in the coal. And I say, Boy, I wish I was a coal miner. I could, I could be collecting those old antiques, go on the antique roadshow and make some money. Come on. You know, when you're talking about fraud, and he can rant and rave about somebody pinning some moths on a tree trunk because he wanted to get a good picture, and then he accepts that somebody found, what was that, a, a, a golden bell or something in a lump of coal? I'm sorry, give me a break. Okay, and this is, this is the final question for tonight, and it's to Dr. Weisenberg, and it says, what Bible did you get your quotes out of? Uh, my Bible, actually, I, I downloaded off the, uh, the internet, uh, and I couldn't tell you because, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Bible version, and I know there are different versions. Uh, I'm not aware how many. Um, that's for scholars of theology, I guess, to tell me. Uh, the issue, of course, that the creationists will never deal with, particularly the fundamentalist Christian creationists, is how we would ever resolve and test different creation views. Creationists don't want to accept any of the evidence from evolutionary biology. That's universally accepted by scientists, and I'm sorry, it is universally accepted by scientists. They don't want to accept that, right? So they come up with their own story, and I say, fine, I gave you a challenge. 
give me some kind of test because there's other creation theories, there's other Bibles, there's other holy books, right? And I, I don't know. I don't know how to choose. You got to give me some predictions, then you got to go out and dig up some dirt and find some evidence. You got to date some rocks. You know, you say it's six thousand years old. Prove it with some, some kind of evidence. Will you date the rocks? Evolutionists are dating the rocks. They have their techniques. They agree on it. They accept it. All the geologists, physicists, and chemists accept it. Well, that's for the creationists. And until they do that, until they can come up with something, anything, which will allow their theories to be tested, you cannot make science simply by attacking somebody else's hypothesis or theories. I've been a scientist, and I know that. If you don't have a better theory, and you can't provide evidence for your theory, right, and have it peer-reviewed, then you're not a scientist, and, you'd have, and you shouldn't be in that place. Look, I would not want to go into your church, your place of worship, right, and say, excuse me, you're a tax-deductible organization. I have a right to come in here and teach your children that there is no God, right? And I would no more do that than the creationists should do what they've been doing. And I, and I think that's really the fundamental problem. Let, let religion stay in the churches, in the home, in the family, where it belongs. Okay, and we're going we're gonna to end with giving Dr. Hovind a rebuttal. Uh, he mentioned six or seven things here. Let me get as many as I can. He's mentioned about the church you know, being tax deductible. I'd like to point out this university is also tax deductible. This, uh, and you're preaching one religion right here, the religion of evolution. Uh, it's worse than tax deductible, it's tax funded. Okay, you have both tax deductions. This, they don't pay tax property on this tax, tax on this property that this building sits on. They also get paid to build this building by tax dollars. So you have a real serious problem. We may be, churches may be tax deductible, but they're not funded by taxes. So you have uh, two strokes against you there. Secondly, you mentioned about better, um, I didn't get to finish to write your quote down here. Let me skip that and watch the tape. But, uh, you mentioned about other holy books. Uh, I stick with the King James Version of the Bible for multiple reasons. I'm very nervous about some of the other so-called holy books we see in the world. Go ahead and get me on there. What happened? Hit it again, would you? For instance, in the Quran, it says, Allah told Muhammad that those who opposed his message should be killed, or they should be nailed to a tree, or their hands and legs should be cut off. In Surah 47, he says, when you meet uh, those who disbelieve, smite at their necks till when you have killed and wounded many of them. The last hour will not come before the Muslims fight the Jews and the Muslims kill them. So I, I get a little nervous about some of these other so-called holy books that have it as part of their teaching that anybody that won't become what you are, you kill them. Okay, I'm definitely not in favor of that, okay? Christianity is certainly very tolerant of all sorts of other religions. Our, found, our country was founded so people could have religious freedom. Secondly, you said creationists do not want to accept evidence that is universally accepted. I have asked repeatedly, what evidence do we have for evolution? I think I pointed out tonight in my first uh, session that all of the so-called evidence that is used to support the theory has been proven wrong. I'm just asking that the lies be taken out of the textbooks. If you have some real evidence, and you saying that it exists and museums are full of it, you're mistaken. Handing me a magazine is not evidence for evolution. I'll be glad to review these articles if you'd like an honest answer. I would like to point out, though, that many, many scientists disagree. There are at least eight different flavors of evolutionists, okay? And they're all, you said, you mentioned several times tonight, they're all arguing among themselves, you know? But the fact of the matter is the argument's closed to real criticism, just like the argument about communism was closed to real criticism in the Soviet Union for many years. They would argue among themselves about you know, what type of communism is best, but you don't ever question, is communism good at all? And it's to the point today where you don't question evolution in the university, you only question which type of evolution is good. I think you have a very closed-minded society here in this university where they're only presenting evidence for one side. There is ample evidence this Earth is not billions of years old. I think that ought to be presented to the kids. For instance, the moon is moving farther away from the Earth every year. The moon gets about three inches farther away every year. 
Obviously, that means it used to be closer. If you go back in time, at some point, you have a problem because the closer the moon is, the higher the tides get. You folks may not worry about the tides here, but in Pensacola, you worry about the tides. The inverse square law makes a real serious problem. Actually, about 1.2 billion years ago, at the current observed rate, the moon would be touching the Earth. And here they are telling us it's 4 billion years old, or 5, 4.6. That simply is not scientifically logical. logical. There is ample evidence that the universe cannot be billions of years old. If it were billions of years old, that still doesn't solve the problem for evolution. There is ample evidence that life only comes from other living things. There is no evidence for spontaneous generation. I mentioned the six different, different flavors of evolution tonight at the beginning. All we see are minor changes within the kind. Now, if somebody wants to believe it was different long ago and far away, well, you just enjoy yourself. But that's a fairy tale for grown-ups, okay? I'm convinced, after studying this for 30-some years, people choose deliberately to believe in this theory, which is totally devoid of evidence, for all sorts of reasons. Some believe it because that's all they've ever heard. They've never heard the other side. Some believe in evolution because they hope there's no God to answer to. Some may have social political reasons because evolution is the foundation for communism and Marxism and Nazism. We cover that for two hours on videotape number three. Some simply don't want God telling them what to do. Now, you do whatever you want, but Judgment Day, we're going to find out who's right and who's wrong. I am convinced the scientific evidence points to a recent creation, six or 7,000 years ago, a global worldwide flood in the days of Noah, that which represents God's authority to judge his creation, and he's coming to judge it again, whether you like it or not. Be ready for that. Thank you so much.